Today's episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. In the summer of 2012, I took a job as an expedition canoe guide on the boundary waters in northern Minnesota and southern Ontario. These are a massive wilderness area of lakes and land. I was working for the Boy Scouts and were based on Moose Lake on the US side. My job was to facilitate a fun and safe multi-day trip anywhere from 7 to 12 days out. Most of that summer was typical too, but one expedition in particular still haunts me as a result of what happened to us over the course of a, a few days. Here is the account in full. So my crew was on the younger side. There were nine of us in total, the maximum allowed in a group per our permit. There were six scouts, two adult advisors, scoutmasters, and myself. They had wanted to do a 200 miler, but didn't have the physical ability, so we had to amend the route. They were bummed out, so I decided to take them to a waterfall called Eddie Falls. It's pretty flat up there, so a waterfall is somewhat rare, but that decision would end up putting us in the path of, well, something. So we visited the falls and we camped near it. That evening, I had the boys working on a camp setup while the advisors worked on fire for the dinner. I was collecting firewood in a big tangle of down trees, brush, and bramble, I could faintly hear the falls off to my left when, out of nowhere, I hear the most unearthly scream or roar that I'd ever heard. It stopped me dead in my tracks and I was frozen. The second scream was much closer and the third even closer than that. I couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the brush, but whatever this was, it was coming directly at me. By the fourth scream, I could feel it in my chest. I got nauseous at this and involuntarily barked at it. I've never before or since heard that sound come out of my body, but the fifth scream almost physically hurt me, but it snapped me back to reality and I ran instantly back to the camp. My crew heard it too, but I had no idea what to tell them. I claimed that it might have been a boar, but there's no boar up here, and the advisors, they knew that I was lying, but didn't call my bluff. After dinner, they went to their tents and I retired to my hammock about 50 yards from camp. As a rule, I always set my hammock up at my head height, so about 6 feet up. I would use a tarp over my body and head to keep the morning dew off and the morning mosquitoes at bay too. But the tarp wasn't strung up and that's important because it was just sort of loosely over me. It must have been around 3 or 4 in the morning when... I was awakened by what sounded to me like a woman sobbing. Not an outright cry, but a sob. At the same time, I'm hearing something walking through the thick brush down past my feet. So I listen, totally still and quiet, as it crosses into camp. I could hear the change from the brush to the granite rock, but could still hear its heavy footfalls as it walked right through camp. And straight towards me. At this point, the tarp is still over my head, so I can't see a thing and I don't know what to do. In no time though, whatever it was, it was standing right next to me. I could hear the breathing too, loud and sort of congested sounding. I could smell the musk and I could feel its enormous presence only inches from my body, just standing there. And it was time to make a decision. I suddenly threw the tarp off of my head... And as I did this, my left hand touched this thing in the chest. It was dark, but I could make out briefly a very large upright figure. The hair on it was long and coarse. The muscularity of this thing, though, was impressive. Bodybuilder status, pectoral, is what I touched, and it all happened in a second. But as soon as my hand made contact, it bolted back into the brush with immense speed for such thick debris. By the time that I got my headlamp on it, it was gone. Unfortunately, my crew had slept through it all, so I just read it until the sun came up and in the end I decided not to mention it. 
The next day we moved on a few miles toward base camp and camped on a small island. Campsites on the US side are designated by a fire pit and a, a grumper, which is a fiberglass toilet over a deep hole really. We were just arriving and it was evening. One of the adult advisors needed to visit the grumper so he walked towards it. About two minutes later, we heard him yelling and he came running back to the camp still pulling his pants up and said that he'd seen a, a gorilla run right in front of him. I asked if maybe it was a bear and he said absolutely not, that he'd hunted bear for years and it was definitely not one. It was a monkey and it was apparently about nine feet tall. At this height estimate, I'm imagining being back in my hammock. If I touched the chest and I was about six feet off the ground, that puts the head close to about nine feet up. So, whatever this thing was, was it stalking us? Was there more than one? The boys are definitely now scared, which meant that it was time to mitigate. I suggest a night paddle, nobody's sleeping anymore anyway, so we pack up and set out around 8pm and paddled by headlamp for several miles. My plan was to get back onto Moose Lake and camp very near to base so we could be the first crew off the water the following day. Moose Lake is connected to Newfoundland Lake by a small pinch and a channel of water that's not very deep or wide, but there's dark woods on both sides. We were right in the middle of the pinch when a rock the size of a basketball came flying out of the woods on the right side and only narrowly missed the bow of the canoe that I was steering. There's no cliff there either. This thing was forcefully thrown at us from the tree line, whatever it was. At this, we paddled like absolute demons. We paddled to the center of the Moose Lake, tied all three canoes together, and we sat out there all night. With the sunrise, we paddled to base camp, and at that, we just ended our expedition. They didn't want to talk about what happened, and to be honest, I was completely fine with that. They left for Oklahoma the next day, and that was that. After they left, I went to work a shift in the canoe yard, helping crews offload. My buddy Justin got back that day from a trip in the same area that we had been in, Bear Loop, and as I was helping him put a boat on the rack, I noticed that he had a distant look, almost a thousand yard stare, if you'd catch my drift, and... I asked how his trip went, and he said that it was all good until they hit Knife Lake or Newfoundland Lake. He said that they were being messed with for two nights on Knife and then had a rock thrown at them in the Newfound Pinch. And sure enough, for a solid two weeks after that, crews kept coming back from that area with very similar stories. One night too, there was a crowd of us guides in the Staff Lodge swapping trail stories and these encounters came up one after another screams, rocks, sightings of apes. Then from the back corner of the room, I hear a chuckle. It's one of the old veteran guides who'd been there for over a decade and all he said was, it's about time somebody else seen one. I asked how long he'd known that they were there and he said that he's been encountering them for like 10 years now. But then he said, they talked to me. This shocked me. Like a language, I asked. No, they communicate telepathically, he said. The less you acknowledge them, the less they'll bother you, but they can read you and they like it when you're afraid. It's like a game to them, is what he said. What happened out there is still a big question in my mind. I've always been open to the idea of Sasquatch. Their existence was never a huge stretch for me, but what really sticks with me is the way that that veteran guide spoke of their intelligence and... Also, apparently, parapsychological abilities. That they can read human emotion as clear as pages in a book. That they know our species perhaps better than we even know ourselves. I'm a 25-year-old male and I live in Utah. And, well, I guess I'm curious if... Any of you guys have seen anything like this before? Because I'm pretty sure that I saw a Wendigo or a Skinwalker. I know it sounds strange or crazy, I get it, but 
I don't really believe in those things, and I'm regularly skeptical myself when it comes to the paranormal, but I definitely saw something. This happened to me when I was 17, and I was in high school and living with my parents. My house at the time was in a very small town. The backyard faced open empty fields and mountains for miles before you reached another civilization at all. My best friend lived next door as well and shared this field as our backyard in a way. I have to explain too that his house sat on what was sort of built on a different street that ended in the field with a small cul-de-sac. I know that sounds weird but I hope you get it. I think that there were supposed to be more houses built down the street at some point to expand the town but they clearly never got around to it. So his driveway was basically in his cul-de-sac even though no other houses were built there. This matters later in the story as well. So, I used to stay the night at my friend's house a lot in high school because I didn't have the best relationship with my parents. Every once in a while, we would wake up to hear dragging and a weird sort of gargling sound from the back porch. His room was the basement room with the window well to the back porch. This would happen maybe a, a couple of times a month, but whenever we would gather the courage to check, nothing would ever be back there. This happened for years too, and in the end we just thought it was maybe the pipes or something. But one night, haunts my friend and I still to this day. You see, my friend was getting ready to move, and we would stay up all night playing games and watching movies and stuff. We decided to go on a music drive to just vibe out, and we hopped in his truck with high beams, swung out of the driveway, turning them on towards the field to use the roundabout. And... When we did that, the light illuminated this, what I can only describe as, thing. It looked like a person, but it definitely wasn't. It was naked, on all fours, abnormally large, particularly its limbs that seemed to fold under itself in a really unnatural way. Its pale skin clung to it like it had been stretched onto it, but the part that still sends shivers down my spine is definitely its face. Its jaw hung open to its gaping black maw, like a snake unhinging its jaw to eat. Its black eyes glistened in the light as it looked at us, but as it turned to see us, it quickly scurried backwards, almost like it was on rewind, into the brush of the field. My friend and I were pale as ghosts. We both looked at each other and just said, Did you see that? We were shaken, and we were afraid. Let's just say too that we tried to have a good rest of the night, but we just could hardly believe what we saw. We ended up just sitting there in the basement with guns all night, ready and waiting to hear the gargling and the dragging again. But that night, we never did. In fact, it was a really anticlimactic night in the end, and it was weird. I now don't live in that town anymore, but there are times when I visit there though, and that empty field, it still feels like it's watching and waiting. And as silly as this sounds, even though I, I can't see it obviously, I still feel inside of me like it's out there somewhere. So I live in Tennessee and I used to go fishing regularly with two other guys before I left the state to go to college this past August. One spot that we really like to fish or just hang out at is in this kind of hidden road that leads to a dead end. The dead end is a, a super tiny parking lot for a lack of a better term, only about maybe five spaces at the max, and we would go for a hiking trail and it sort of forces you to turn around at one point. For an idea of how hidden this spot is actually, my friends and I have even thrown parties out there and we've never been seen. We usually fish late at night there and also have a fire going since we're out super late anyway and it's in the middle of the woods. But one night, a bit past midnight, we had a few rods out along the water while we cooked some burgers on the fire. One friend decided that he wanted to try and toast his burger bun and everything and the way Subway sort of toasts your sandwich is what he said. The bun got a bit too burned and was solid, so I told him to put whatever meat was left with the bait and to just toss the bun. It's totally dark, mind you, and we're right next to the water. 
The only light that we had was the fire, our phone screens, and occasionally the inside of our cars when we had to walk like 10 to 15 feet away to grab other fishing gear. We did, however, have headlamps, but we didn't use them too much because the battery life would drain super quickly if we used them. These headlamps were really powerful though, but the only constant light, the fire, it was only illuminating so much of the water in front of us. Only like five feet at most, so everything after that was pitch black, but still water. So after putting the remaining meat in the bait bucket and mixing it, I told them that I had to take a leak. Before I walked away, my friend asked what to do with the burnt bun and we both told them to just throw it in the water and that the fish would take care of the rest. As I turned away, I was able to catch my friend throwing the bun into the darkness out of the corner of my eye. I walked back towards the entrance of the woods across the road behind us and did my business. While I did, I heard them just sort of chatting away, cutting up and the other friend giving the first friend trouble for burning the bun I think. As they're laughing about it, I'm still in the middle of my leak and I suddenly hear them stop laughing and it got completely silent. As I finished up though, I heard frantic shuffling with the sound of fishing lines being reeled in. The friend who threw the bread was sort of packing up his gear. Those who fish understand packing up is the worst part, but the other friend too who carries was now holding his gun and turned his headlamp and scanning the water in front of where they were set up. I obviously came back and asked him what was going on, and he quietly told me to help pack up our stuff and to kick the fire over into the water. Due to him being goofy normally, I asked no questions and I did what he said. I remember picking up a piece of a hamburger bun next to the fire and tossing it into the water right in front of me as I was heading back to my car after kicking the fire over. And we were out of there faster than any other time that we left that fishing spot really. Keep in mind that we're way out in the sticks so it took us a bit to get to the closest gas station which we use as a last stop to get anything that we need before heading to this spot. The gas station is closed but the parking lot to the side of it is always lit up by the street lights. So we pulled into there and that was when I finally asked them what was going on but they were both still wide eyed and visibly shaken. It turns out though that while I was taking a leak the piece of burnt bread my friend had thrown into the darkness actually flew back out of there and landed right at their feet. I saw my friend throw that bread and briefly saw it fly into the darkness across from us too. And also, the piece that I threw back into the water on my way out, that was actually the same piece. I always work closing shifts, so sometimes I wouldn't fish with them, but they'd fish together at other spots in the area along that lake. And they told me about their other encounters with weird and unexplainable things before, but I always just brushed them off. But this time, this time it was different because, I mean, I saw my friend throw that bread into the water and thinking back on it, that bread was definitely the one that I re-threw back into the water again. How was that possible? So some folks don't stop searching until they find the truth. And if you've got the eye of a detective, June's Journey is the game for you. Play as the intrepid June Parker and follow her story to solve the death of her sister. You'll hunt for clues in hundreds of beautifully illustrated scenes to uncover new clues in this thrilling murder mystery set in the Roaring Twenties. I've actually really enjoyed playing this game in my spare time. It sort of reminds me of those old school finder books where you have to look for a bunch of different items or people. But the really interesting thing about this particular game is that you're doing this in the midst of a murder mystery, so you have to find clues that assist with solving a crime in a much larger story. I also really like some of the unique features like the ability to build your own island estate with expensive gardens and beautiful buildings, but I especially love the contest for the short stories which allows you to win prizes. I know that some of you listeners are rather gifted writers, so for you guys, it's definitely worth checking out. All in all, it's a really fun game that has kept me coming back for more during my downtime on my phone when I'm between tasks and chores and have a spare minute or two. I only started recently, so I'm on chapter 2 and at the moment, I'm continuing with Claire and Harry Van Buren's Homicide. It's free to download and is a really great way to unwind if you enjoy puzzles like I do. 
So, find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. In December of 2005, me and a few high school friends were back home from our respective universities. We were juniors at the time and started a traditional winter break of freshman year to visit random state, parks or smaller towns and explore them, along with the occasional mischief that we would end up getting into at some point. During these one night trips, the three of us would all fall asleep in the back of my Tahoe on a large mattress pad. This kept us safe from the elements and set my paranoid mind at ease should we be subjected to any foul play as well. But we decided this year to go to the Davy Crockett National Forest area. This area has many places that are extremely rural and desolate, which was exciting because we had previously found some interesting things and abandoned structures on our previous excursions. I had used up my rest of my university printing credits to print detailed map quest pages for us so that we could use them for navigation while we were visiting. The drive was roughly two hours from our hometown, but we decided to start the trip off in Lufkin, just east of the National Forest, to eat dinner and get a few things from Walmart. After dinner, we decided to mess around and get into our normal shenanigans like we always did. A few hours later, we found ourselves in Crockett, Texas, about an hour west of Lufkin. We planned on staying in a campground about halfway between the two cities, so had a lot of flexibility when it came to time. We explored random roads and went into a few abandoned buildings before getting bored and wanting to go somewhere else. By this time, it was about 12.30, in the morning that is, and at this point in the night, I needed an energy boost, so decided to stop at a gas station in Kennard, Texas, which was about 30 minutes east of Crockett. I go inside to buy a few snacks, energy drinks, a few cans, to give us some fuel for the rest of the night. With a nice buzz from the energy drink, we decided to get a, a little more adventurous and we venture down FM 357, south of Kennett. We come across a few forest service roads that ventured off into rural residential roads and other country roads. I pull off on the side of the road to check MapQuest and match the cross streets that we're at and give it to my other two friends to assist with navigation. After getting back onto the road, I notice that it's 1.30 in the morning and we all joke about how we are miraculously uh, still awake. I decided to head down the next service road that we came across and this, this is where things started to get pretty weird and where parts of my memory are well, erased, I guess, due to the sheer adrenaline that I had at that time. So after driving down a few more service roads and taking random turns, we get to a road that is much more narrow compared to the others. By this time, I get incredibly frustrated because it is almost 2.15 in the morning and I don't want to stumble into somebody else's front yard in a rural area in the middle of the night. So I decided to slowly proceed down the road when... Suddenly I noticed a, a faint light in the distance. Great, I thought. Just great. I'm about to spook some random poor soul awake. And about 30 seconds later, I can tell that these are headlights now, but they suddenly disappeared. I thought someone may have turned up ahead, but I was very wrong. About 10 or 15 seconds later, I see what appeared to be a brand new black Chevy Suburban. The second that I put my high beams on it, its lights turned on and three men dressed in full suits jump out and sprint down the road past my car. It was almost like they were lifeless, but they didn't even look at my car. As they were running past me, the Suburban suddenly shifts into reverse and conducts the fastest reverse maneuver that I'd ever seen. At this point, I unholster and tell my friends to grab my AR. We were all scared and I had zero clue what we were about to come up on as we drove forward. Mind you, these were the days where cell phone coverage was pretty much non-existent in many areas of this region of the state, so we had no way to call for help if something did happen. As we reached the end of the road, we came upon FM 357, the same road that we'd originated from. I still don't know how this is possible. I mean, it felt like we were just venturing further and further away from that road and we passed a US Forest Service fire station again on the way out like we had on the way in too. What I mean is that 
we traveled the same road twice somehow. I recently checked Google Maps for any US Forest Service fire station off of FM 357 and I cannot find any current or past historical data on it. The county tax assessor doesn't have any listings either. In any case, we got back on FM 357 and we decided to book it to downtown Crockett as we didn't feel comfortable with sleeping in a campsite after what had just happened. And I have since made sure to never venture down unknown roads without referencing GPS or maps at the very least. I am still processing that short but very weird and unsettling event. Where did those men come from? Why were they in suits in the middle of the forest? Where did the black suburban go that vanished into the night? Me and my friends still occasionally talk about this incident and no one can seem to come up with a, a sound explanation. The thing that bothers me the most though is I cannot find any evidence of this road that we were on. Google Earth software doesn't even have a road or satellite imagery that lines up with what happened. Nor does it have evidence of a fire station or any structure for that matter. So I don't know if we just went down the wrong road or if something really weird happened that night. So an old friend hit me up a little while ago and I started reminiscing and remembered this. I believe that I've encountered the black-eyed children over a decade ago in rural Appalachia. This has always low-key disturbed me. Keeping in touch to this day, we've never brought it up again either. So we were at a local state park sort of place at between 9pm and 1am. I remember that we were parked alongside the woods and some picnic tables it was pretty desolate. We were technically trespassing, 17 female and 17 male at that time. And what we were doing there, you can probably leave to your imagination. But as our curfews were approaching and we were finishing up our time together, we experienced what I, we experienced what I can only describe as a, a very ominous feeling. He was in the driver's seat preparing to start the car and pull off. The car doesn't start though. We sort of laugh it off as it wasn't the first time and we just talked. When suddenly, to the right, passenger side where I was sitting, we see faint lights coming out of the woods. The ominous feeling intensified obviously and emerging from the woods, there are four or five children, younger than us, like appearing to be maybe 7 to 11 years old. And now, I'm not going to claim that they had black eyes because, truthfully, it was dark and I don't remember as I was pretty shook up, but I didn't read about the black eyed children lore or phenomenon until years later, which described everything else that we experienced that night. All I can say is that they were definitely not normal. They didn't belong, I guess is the best way to put it. The cabins at the park were not occupied, they weren't even getting rented out as it was autumn and winter. We were miles from the park's hotel. There were no adults either. They were absolutely just completely out of place. What were the lights? Well, I don't know, but the closest thing that I can compare them to are like glow sticks. As if they had opened a, a package of those novelty glow sticks that included bracelets, necklaces, or wands sort of thing, but it wasn't like they were having fun or goofing off or anything. They just stopped, stood there, and sort of ominously stared at us. He tried asking what they were doing, if they were lost or where their parents were, but there was no response. The oldest looking male child, a bit heavyset with a grey hoodie on, approached the vehicle just in front where the passenger head like corner would be. My friend started really freaking out at this moment. He locked the doors and was like, heck no, we gotta go. Eventually, thankfully, the car starts too. But the children, they don't move, and the kid stays put in front of the car. My friend eventually yells to the kid, I'm going to run you over. The boy slowly backs away, raises his arm, and points at us as we were leaving. We didn't look back, and well, we obviously never saw them again, but it is one of the weirdest nights that I've ever had.
It's been about a year since my husband and I had an encounter with this tall, mysterious creature, but I haven't been able to let it go since. It's been plaguing my dreams and keeping me from being outside at night even. So I thought that I'd share it here in hopes that anyone might have similar stories or encounters. It was the middle of winter and everything was powdered in white. Life had gotten quite slow, so my husband and I decided to take our two small children to his parents' house to enjoy a date night together. My in-laws only live four blocks away from us on the very bottom of a mountain in Utah County, so it wasn't a far drive. It was around four in the evening when we left our kids with my in-laws and we had only planned to pick up some sushi and head back home. But by the time that we were done and back at my in-laws, it was around 5.45 in the evening. The sun was shining brightly but was about to make its way out for the night. We gathered up the kids, put their coats on and headed out to the car. My father-in-law and 19-year-old brother-in-law walked out with us to say goodbye to the kids. As we were buckling them into their seats, we heard this horrendous noise. It sounded like a woman crying, a child laughing and a bird sort of cawing all at once. My father-in-law looked at me and said, Are you hearing this? My husband said, Yeah, you heard that too? My brother-in-law mentioned that he could hear it too and I just stood there, silent, trying to dissect whatever this sound was and where it was coming from. And then I heard my father-in-law say, Look on the mountain! He was pointing up about a hundred yards away and I quickly grabbed the glasses from the top of my head for a better look. And there it was. Something big, completely black, and it was hunched over a bush. We stared and listened to its cry in the silence. I said, I'm getting my binoculars, to my father-in-law and he turned to run to the house. We stared and listened to its cry in silence. I'm going to go and get my binoculars, said my father-in-law and he turned to run to the house. The unbearable sound stopped though and the creature slowly stood upright to look at us. Whatever it was, it was long, skinny, all black, and it could have been maybe eight to nine feet tall. It had the body of a man, sort of, but disproportionately skinny and extremely long. Its arms were incredibly long, in fact. They definitely passed the knees, and it had no facial features, no nose, no eyes, just complete darkness. We collectively stood in silence, staring at each other and at this thing, and about 15 seconds had passed. It began to quickly float up the mountain. I'm not talking float as in was so fast that you couldn't see its legs. I'm talking literally floating up the mountain, like it was levitating. My husband describes it was about 20 miles per hour in speed, but it wasn't long before, whatever it was, completely dissipated into the tip of the mountain. I will never forget that day, and I have not seen anything like it since. In fact, I, I hope I never really see anything like it ever again. So my wife and I recently purchased our first home after the birth of our daughter. Everything was as you would expect the first few months to be as well. Painting, decorating, renovating, basking in our newfound slice of the American dream. You get the idea. Unusual things started happening though, several months ago. One day, as I was getting home from after work, I passed by a strange truck two or three houses down from ours. I say strange for a few reasons too. I mean, we know literally everyone in our small neighborhood, and I'd never seen this truck or person before. There's no reason for through traffic to come down our street, and the truck was also driving very slowly. Like, put it in drive but don't press on the gas slowly. As I pulled into the driveway, the truck flipped a U-turn and came back towards my house. Getting out of my car, the truck crawled by and the driver stared daggers at me as he passed, and then just sped off. I don't like to judge based on appearances, and I like to think that I don't scare easily, but... Something about this guy's eyes just gave me a really bad feeling. Now obviously this was weird. I mentioned what happened to my wife, telling her that we should be more mindful about security. 
When I told her the type of truck, my wife said that that same truck drove by and the guy stared at me when I got home this afternoon. I thought that he was just being creepy and checking me out. I tried to tease her a bit, you know, to lighten the mood up. Calling her cocky for assuming any guy driving by was checking her out. I just didn't want to freak her out, but I was definitely freaked out myself. Anyway, we saw the truck a few more times over the next couple of weeks, either driving by slowly or parked down the block and facing our yard. But one day, the truck stopped driving by and well, we haven't seen it since. I sort of dismissed the whole thing as being just paranoid. But then, other things started happening. In the past month or so, my wife and I have been hearing tapping on the windows at the front of our house at night. It happened two or three times to each of us separately, always around 10 or 11 p.m., and always a soft but distinct tapping. It sounds like knocking with a single knuckle, I guess, on the metal part of the screen door. The first time that my wife and I heard the tapping together was last weekend. We were in the front room playing with our daughter around maybe 9.30, just about to settle her down for bed, and our front room has a, a large, almost floor-to-ceiling window running the length of the wall next to the front door, which faces the street. We're all sitting on the floor with our backs to the window, reading our daughter a book when we heard it. Tapping. Now, our house is older, creaks and cracks are not uncommon, but this sound was so distinctly intentional that my wife and I immediately looked at each other and bolted up out of the room. I had my wife and daughter lock themselves in a back room while I turned on all the lights, and I also did a sweep around the outside of the house. Of course, I didn't see anything, and was ready to dismiss the whole thing as just paranoia over something that probably had an innocent explanation. That is, until last night. So around 9.45, we heard our daughter making noise in the baby monitor. I waited a few minutes to see if she would settle down, but when it became clear that she wouldn't, uh, I got up to put her back to sleep. The layout of the room is important to visualize this next part, so bear with me. So this room is on the side of our house, but the exterior wall just out a bit in a sort of L shape. And the corner of this L is made up of windows. If you're standing in the door to the room, you're directly across from these windows in one corner. And there's a rocking chair in the other corner pointed towards the front of the house. One window faces the street and the other faces our neighbor's house. My garden bed planted with small shrubs wraps around the outside of the house directly underneath as well. So I was sitting in the chair, getting my daughter to settle down again. I had a lamp on, so the room was softly lit. Once she fell asleep, I stood up to put her in her crib when something caught my eye. There was a, a figure standing about a foot away from the window in the bare space between the shrubs and the house and they were staring at us. I didn't look long enough to see anything more than what appeared to be a man in a light grey hoodie standing a few feet away on the other side of the glass. Sprinting from the room, I brought my daughter back to my wife and I's bedroom, leaving her while telling my understandably confused wife to lock the door. After turning off all the lights inside the house and turning on all the lights outside, I began moving from room to room. I was peering out the windows into the darkness. I, I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. Whoever it was must have taken off after seeing me notice them and make a quick exit. Obviously, I had some trouble sleeping after this. I spent hours checking security cameras and going from room to room, looking out windows into the night, hoping that I would catch something, but also not hoping that I would see anything that could explain what happened. This morning, I went outside to the spot where the figure would have been standing. I thought, or hoped maybe, that there was a plant or something that I mistook for a person. When I got to the spot, I realized the figure had to be standing exactly in a bare patch of ground about maybe two feet in diameter, directly in front of that window. Part of me is still hoping that I'm just being paranoid. The mind can play tricks on you in the dark after all, seeing things that aren't really there, especially when you're a sleep-deprived new parent, right? But with everything that's been happening, I just can't shake the feeling that there was actually someone out there last night, watching us. I really do hope that I am wrong though.
it's taken me years to work up the courage to post this story to strangers because, well, the events that took place all those years ago left me puzzled and, frankly, disturbed. It's perhaps best if I provide some background context because it may help strengthen my story and people will hopefully believe me as well. I know that a lot of people claim to have a, a true story about strange encounters in the woods and I don't want people to accuse me of making this all up. I swear to you that this really did happen. It's not supernatural, it took place during the daytime and the monster is very much human. So when I was about 13 or maybe 14 years old, back in 2003 to 2004, I went on a camping trip with my mother and stepfather and my four younger siblings. We were not a, a very well-off family. In fact, we were pretty poor to be honest. I never went on holidays abroad and we would always just go camping, usually to the same campsite which felt like miles away but was in reality less than 10 miles from the city where we lived. We had been there a few times previously and we knew the campsite and the surrounding area fairly well. It was all in all a pretty safe and familiar place. On this occasion, everything was going as normal. Truthfully, I sort of hated camping. My parents would always argue too when it came to putting up the tent. It was pretty boring being in the woods and I would normally be the one entertaining my siblings. I hated not having electricity, access to proper toilets and showers, etc. It could be quite fun looking back and I do treasure the memories that I have with my stepdad who is no longer with us. But all in all it was just a, a rather uncomfortable experience. Usually though, we would go on long hikes or bike rides with my stepdad using maps to charter our way to a small village promising to get us all ice cream when we got there, which was a real treat as we never normally had it. On this camping trip, we were going to go on a 10 mile bike ride. Both my parents had their own bikes, along with my sister and I. My stepdad's bike had the small trailer where my three younger siblings, all under the age of five, were sitting. It was hard work going on these epic long bike rides, but I did enjoy being in the middle of the woods surrounded by nature. This was one of the things that I actually liked. And I mean, we weren't in the middle of nowhere by any means, but it was pretty remote. Remote enough for it to be inaccessible to public transport. Only forest ranger type vehicles could access the roads. They weren't real roads paved with tarmac. More like dirt roads which were really only suited for bicycles. During all the times that we went camping, we never saw any other vehicles go down these roads too. On this day though, we were all cycling down this road when suddenly we hear the sounds of a vehicle coming up slowly behind us. My stepdad is in front of us when he stops and tells us to move aside to let the vehicle come past. But there's a sense of urgency and confusion in his tone as he's unsure and why there's even a vehicle there. The vehicle passes us and we're expecting to see a forest ranger vehicle. You know, like a 4x4 pickup or a Land Rover type of vehicle. But instead, we see an East State station wagon type of car with a long body and a large trunk with a window at the back. In the back of this station wagon, I also see several large trash bags, and it was a very strange sight. I may only be a teenager, but this is a sight that sets off alarm bells for several reasons, and I knew it at the time too. Like first of all, this is not a car that is designed to go off roads in the woods like this. Second, as previously mentioned, we've never encountered any vehicles down this bike road before, like ever. Thirdly, the person driving is clearly not lost as they didn't stop to ask for directions. Fourth, there are big black trash bags in the back of the car that look very suspicious. What I mean by this point is that they're full and tied up very tightly. We could all see into the back of the car and I didn't see anything poking out of the bag to indicate that it was full of garbage or anything. And fifthly, the driver looked very rough. And I don't mean to sound rude, but he looked really mean. I can't recall his features, just that he didn't look like a friendly person that belonged to the countryside. He wore dark clothing and I think he was clean shaven and had very short hair. I wish that I remembered more about exactly what this man looked like. As if this incident couldn't get any stranger though, what took place next 
has left such an impression on me that I still recall the sense of fear that I felt at the time as I share this. Uh, the car drives on several more feet, then the driver stops. For what feels like the longest time in my entire life, nothing happens. We're all just sort of watching this car dumbfounded. My stepdad has told us to remain still. He's really serious all of a sudden too, as he's assessing the situation. Then, the car's reverse light comes on and the car starts reversing up to us. My stepdad, who was in the army for several years and was one of the toughest guys that I knew, goes into full-on panic mode. He tells us to run. We don't even get on our bicycles to ride. Instead, we all flee on foot, running with our bicycles through the woods until we find a railway bridge which we had previously passed over. We never looked back, and I have no idea if the man in the car got out to go after us or anything. I don't know if he just continued driving. I have no idea who he was or what was in those bags. But why he reversed that day was strange. We never really spoke about what happened after that. I know it was something that seriously scared my stepdad because of his response, and it's left me frightened about who I might encounter in the woods until this very day. So I live in Virginia in a pretty rural area. My house is a townhome in a neighborhood right next to a middle school. I've lived in this house for over 10 years now and frequently went on walks during the daytime all around the neighborhood itself, plus the surrounding buildings and the woods, but I've never gone on a walk at night here. After starting college, I got very accustomed to taking walks around my campus at night when the weather was nice. So now that I'm home for winter break and Virginia is in one of its uh, weirdly warm winter weeks, I decided that I may as well go on a walk at night here, since it's a safe area and night walks are almost daily routines for me now. So I leave my home at around midnight, not pretty late. I walk over to the middle school and I sit down on the track. The track is a concrete oval going around the soccer field. I'm just sitting there relaxing, listening to music with one earbud in. I also had a, a lit candle on the ground in front of me, which sounds kind of weird of me to have now that I mention it, I know, but lighting candles while I sit and chill somewhere outside is just a, a habit I developed from having a ton of candles and being unable to light them in my room at college. Anyway... It was around this point that I hear what sounded like a cough, so I instantly stop my music and start looking around. I don't see anything, but I'm an extremely paranoid person, so I'm still very on edge, even though everything seems fine. I just sit there doing nothing for maybe one or two minutes, and I start settling back down, thinking that maybe the cough was just leaves in the nearby woods between my neighborhood and this soccer field. So I'm almost fully relaxed, but... Then I heard the cough again. Then I see something sprint on its back legs across the field faster than I've ever seen anything move before. And it gets to the other end of the field and then continues to stand there on its hind legs. I couldn't see it super well because it was dark and far away. Since I just heard coughing and it was running on two legs, I initially thought that it must have been a person, but when it was standing still, I could see that it was too large and weirdly proportioned to be a human. It was also screeching the whole time, sort of, like an incredibly loud horror movie creature screeching that made my ears ring. It looked like its back was to me, so I took the opportunity to pack up and sprint home at that, not wanting to hear the sound anymore, and obviously I was pretty freaked out. I'm also physically disabled, and I can move around just fine, but never very quickly. I literally cannot think of another time in my life where I have ever run that fast, though. Now, the only sort of paranormal thing that I believe in is plain old ghosts, so as soon as I got home, I texted all of my friends about it and googled all that I could. Everyone that I texted reassured me that it was probably just an injured or diseased animal, since that can make deer act weird like that. So, that was a little bit reassuring, but... At the time, I'm googling about deer running on their hind legs and screeching their heads off. And while it's a decently documented occurrence, none of the pictures and the videos on any websites are anywhere near what I saw. In fact, the only accounts of experiences just like mine are posts and on other subreddits. And they were 
about skinwalkers and stuff. Also, two additional details that I should add are that, one, I'm just assuming that it was a deer based on its size. It didn't have antlers or anything. I couldn't really tell what it was, and I'm mainly going with deer because I'm very skeptical about paranormal topics, and I don't want to assume that it was anything other than a deer. And two, I've read descriptions of deer running on their hind legs, and I've watched videos of it, in fact. But none of the videos that I've seen really match up with just how strangely fast this thing was moving. Like, it was basically a blur running past me. Anyway, to this day I still don't know what it was, but I just wanted to get this out there. Maybe someone knows Appalachian animals better than I do and can reassure me that it was just a sick deer or something. In any case, I hope all of you guys had a happy new year and are all doing well. So I'm not really sure if this would be considered a, a paranormal story per se, but nothing else really makes sense. Let me explain. My family would go camping every chance that we got, and the place that we'd always go had no natural predators, at least nothing bigger than a fox. My dad specifically chose this spot so us kids, me and my two siblings, could sort of frolic through the woods without having to worry too much. This particular trip was during the May long weekend. There was still a considerable amount of snow, so my dad brought our ATVs and some sleds for us. It was the day after we had arrived and my dad wanted to go on a little trip down the road that we came up. I asked if I could come and he said sure. We both hopped on his quad and we set out on our little trip. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention too earlier that we had deer around this area. Nothing crazy, but the odd one would wander through our campsite every now and then. You could tell that they had no natural predators though for sure, since they didn't run away when there was a human around even. And my siblings and I would always manage to get pretty close to one, before my parents yelled at us to stay away from them. Anyway, my dad and I were a few miles away from the campsite when we rounded a corner and came across one of the most gruesome sights that I've ever seen in my entire life. On the side of the road were the pieces of a deer, at least I think it was one. There was blood absolutely everywhere. Worse still, there was steam coming from the remains, which meant that this was a recent kill. My dad is usually a pretty calm guy, not much can really rattle him, but I could tell that this freaked him out a lot. He was in the process of turning us around when this, I don't know, screech came from the forest? It was so loud that we both flinched and I remember searching the forest for the source but my dad was in the process of hauling butt down the way that we came. It could have been a trick of the light or because I was freaked out and maybe I was seeing things but I could have sworn that I saw something running alongside of us but only for a second or two. I know that I sound absolutely crazy but the thing genuinely looked like an absolutely enormous dog before it vanished into the trees. My dad traced back to the camp and we were all packed up and headed to a different location by the end of that day. We never did go back to that campsite after this encounter too. I did ask my dad about it a couple of years ago, and he just said that it was because the new campsite was better than the old one, better trails and whatnot. But honestly, I think he was full of it. I think whatever we encountered that day scared the absolute heck out of him, and I think that whatever I saw, he must have as well. But I for one, am actually thankful that we never went back. I'm not sure if I would be able to sleep at night, to be honest, after what I saw there. And it still plagues my memories to this day. So I sleep in the basement of a, a one-story house out in the country. I've never seen or heard anything unexplainable. Until, out of nowhere, weird noises could be heard outside of our house one night. About three years ago, the first noises were heard by both me and my mum. We had let the dog out around 12 at night and were letting him back in and talking when we heard a sound that no animal could make. It sounded like a, a large cat that had its throat slit. 
It was like a, a gargling meow, and we both immediately stopped talking and looking outside to see if there was anything just outside, because that's where it sounded like it was coming from, just beyond where our house's lights could reach, but we couldn't see anything. It was like something just letting you know that it's there, then not doing anything or making another sound. The next incident happened a couple of months after when I was sleeping outside my room since I didn't have a bed at the time and the futon couldn't fit through my doorway. It was late at night, I was watching TV and I heard what sounded like someone moving stuff around just outside of my laundry room. The layout of my basement is pretty open so from where I was laying I could see almost everything in the basement except the laundry room and another open area at the bottom of the stairs. So... I honestly thought that someone might have come down to get something from the fridge or the freezer, so I just went back to watching TV. But a couple of seconds later, I heard someone walking around barefoot, and since the floor is concrete, you can hear it pretty clearly. So I sat up and thought that somebody was going to turn the corner, but then the walking turned into a full-on sprint, and that was when it happened. I watched as the footsteps ran past in front of me, but... Nobody was there. They disappeared into our unfinished bathroom and stopped instantly and when I say instantly I mean no slowdown in the footsteps, just an abrupt stop. My dog used to sleep in the bathroom but after that he refused to even come downstairs. After that I had my first and last sleep paralysis episode too where I heard the same footsteps before a pitch black person on all fours crawled at me and got right in my face before disappearing under the futon. And the final incident happened probably three or four months later when I was finally back in my room. I was laying in bed when I heard those footsteps again but it sounded like they were running around sort of aimlessly. After a good minute of this they stopped in front of my door and it went quiet but only for a few seconds before my doorknob began to jiggle back and forth. I have never had that sense of dread ever in my life too and I have never been that scared before. I ran to my door, grabbed the knob and sat with my back against the door and my feet pushing against the wall opposite. I even looked under the door and I confirmed that there was nothing there. I probably sat there for 30 minutes before I got the courage to move and Throughout those 30 minutes, I kept looking under the door and there was nothing. I slept with a steel bar that night because I was absolutely convinced that there was someone in our house. Since that night, nothing major has happened but sometimes when I come back into my room and close the door, I'll turn around and my door, for whatever reason, will be open again. So I don't really normally share stories often, but I've been listening to some here and it sparked an encounter that I had years ago on a, a solo bike tour that I thought was worth sharing. So it was the spring after I graduated college. I'm 22 and female and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided to take a pause and ride my bike down the coast from Canada to Mexico I was pretty nervous to be going by myself, but for the majority of the time I felt safe. Halfway through or so, I got pretty comfortable with sleeping alone in fairly empty campsites and parks, etc. There were even some stretches on the trip that I rode with other bike tourists, and this one encounter, however, brought my guard back up for the remainder for sure. So I was halfway down the Oregon coast and was a mile or so out from the campground that I had planned to stay for the night. There was this notable yellow vintage Ferrari, I think it was, car that had passed me headed in the opposite direction. When I pulled into the campground, I stopped at the information board to look at the map and the fees. As I'm sitting there, I see the yellow car coming down the road and stops where I am. This older guy in his late, maybe 50s or early 60s, gets out and starts looking at the board with me. He's friendly and seems completely normal, charismatic even. He's asking me about my trip and starts mentioning how he's from the area but has never checked out this campground. At this point I'm still pretty naive. There's plenty of nice people that I've met on the trip that chat me up and ask me about the bike tour. 
He's talking to me and getting closer, and this part is what starts to make me a bit uneasy. He would repeatedly reach out his hand to shake mine like he was about to leave, but every time he shook my hand, he would grab my forearm with his other hand and do this weird sort of gasp laugh thing. The way that he did it looked absolutely insane, and the arm grass was very firm. It immediately sent shivers down my spine. But then he suddenly dives into another topic and repeats this freaky handshake maybe two more times in between. I realize then that I'm completely out of sight from anyone in the campground, have no phone service, and I'm now very close to him and his open car door. There's a knot in my stomach. I'm on the verge of tears and my voice is shaking with every response. At the time, I didn't know why, but something just felt very off about him. I finally speak up loud, hoping somebody can hear me, and tell him that I have to get going, run to my bike and speed to the campground. When I get there, I don't even try to find the hike and bike spots and just throw a tent down directly across from the camp host. And thankfully, I, I didn't see him after that. Again, I had a lot of encounters with random strangers at this point, but none of them terrified me like this one did. I fought with the idea that he was probably just an overly friendly guy, but the fact that he would repeatedly grab my arm like that and laugh like that was frightening. All in all, most people that I met were sweet and it made me very trusting of others. And even if he was harmless, his actions were a good reminder that I had to be mindful of my vulnerable situation and I had to be much more alert. So something a little bit eerie, I guess you could say, happened to me one night on night shift when I was closing and doing outside trash. A chore that I have to do because I was closing. I was listening to music since there were no customers and the lot was empty. Two of my co-workers, cook and manager, were both inside doing what they had to do before leaving. I noticed a red car pulling into a stall, but not all the way. The car was parked in this strange way, kind of sort of sideways and far away from the stall where they would call in, I guess. I noticed it was an elderly couple and the husband rolls his windows down and says something. I couldn't really hear him, so I paused my music and asked if he could repeat. And it sounded like he said, are you here alone? So I laughed and said, no, I wasn't alone. They stayed there for a while before pulling out but they stopped for such an unusual amount of time in the middle of the lot that it was a bit weird. This was when one of my co-workers walked out leaving. He's around the same age as me and we said our goodbyes. As I continued doing the trash, I noticed the car had went back to the main road in front of my workplace, but only to turn back into the lot again in a sort of slow and unusual way. I started to freak out a bit and I tried to hurry at this point. I noticed the car was gone for a while, so I thought that they left. So I was heading back to the dumpster, the big one, to throw away the trash bags when I saw it. The red car was right behind the dumpster at the stop sign. It was parked there, and this was when I quickly called my brother and I put him on speaker. I talked so loudly that anyone could hear me, and I was honestly on the verge of tears. Once I hung up though, the car had finally started to move slowly, paused for a moment again, then finally left for good. I don't know what really happened, but I just felt like I was being stalked that night. I don't know if they had good intentions or not, but I realized that my co-worker had stayed in his truck with the engine running the whole time. I can't remember exactly, but I do believe that his truck was right next to the dumpster and he may not have known what was going on, but... I'm really thankful that he didn't leave just yet because I'm kind of coming to grips with the fact that maybe, maybe this was an attempt at kidnapping or something. This was my very first job, so I don't know if this was common or not, or if the people just were looking out for me or something, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Is this normal, or should I have been more concerned? I haven't told anyone at work about what happened. And I'm wondering if I should. What do you guys think?
It all started about a month ago when a man started banging on my door at six at night yelling for Mike to come out, that he needs to see him and get cigarettes. I told him that he had the wrong house and to leave. There has never been a Mike in this house. He got even more aggressive though, calling me a liar and how he was going to come in and beat the skinny living whatever out of me and I tried to call the non-emergency police line because I've never called 911 before and they didn't even pick up. Looking back, it was stupid but it was instinct but after some more yelling, eventually he leaves. I called my father who was across town to come home and what was going on and he showed up. He called 911 to file a report. The guy came back and started screaming at him though. Cops were called again, showed up half an hour after the call and couldn't find him and told me to defend myself if it came to it. I ended up staying with a friend for the night because I didn't think I would feel safe at home. I can be a strong person but I just don't think that I can do much against a, a drugged out man like that. What made the situation even scarier to me though is that as I was going through my driveway camera photos, it shows him walking up to my house hours before and I didn't even have any idea about this. I have really bad anxiety so the next few days were filled with paranoia and stress but I managed to finally calm down and convince myself that that was the end of it. Come that weekend, my father went on a trip with his girlfriend so I was left alone for a couple of days. I just put on a scary movie when... I heard screaming again and a loud bang. I pull up my camera and see that he's back, pacing back and forth on the sidewalk and has thrown over our trash can. Again, this guy's screaming for Mike and I call 911 and they show up within minutes this time and are able to stop him down the street. They tell me that there's really nothing that they can do since he hasn't committed a crime yet but if he comes back to call them again and then they'll have more reason to hold him. Things were quiet for a few weeks too, and so I again believed that that was the end of it, until today. This morning my father and I got into an argument, so I wanted to take a walk to clear my mind. I went across the street to a park and sat by a tree watching cars pass every now and then, and it was beautiful morning weather. I noticed a truck drive down the left side of the park and turned to the street my back is facing, he waved as he passed, so I did too, thinking that it was just a man going to work. I wanted to show that I was okay, thinking that that might have been what he was asking about. He then pulls off into the right side of the park, stops, makes a U-turn to come back. Red flags instantly go off in my head, so I get up to start walking home. I look back and see that he's turned off his headlights and is trailing me. I get to the front of my house and he slows. I get a, a better look at his face this time and it looks like the man that had been harassing me. From the physical characteristics to his red baseball cap, he just glared at me like I took everything in his life away from him. I get to the door and try to barge in but my father put the chain on in anger of me walking out so I had to yell to him that I was being followed and to open the door. He opens it and... By then, the truck was gone and it was down the street. Now, I'm terrified to leave my home. I don't have a car to get anywhere quickly. I have to bike, but even now I'm scared to do that. I don't know who that man is or what his deal is or what his intentions are, but I live in paranoia just waiting to find out. So I'll need to explain some context here, so bear with me. Rock Island is a state park located at the tip of Door County, Wisconsin on Lake Michigan. It's a pretty difficult place to get to, in fact. To get to the island, you have to take a car ferry from Ellison Bay to Washington Island, drive across Washington Island to Jackson Harbor, then take a pedestrian-only ferry to Rock Island. No vehicles or bikes are allowed on Rock Island. Now, even though the island is relatively small at about 975 acres, it has had an interesting history. In the early 1600s, it was inhabited by a tribe of Native Americans as well as a small fishing village of European settlers. The two groups 
They didn't trust each other and did have a few bad encounters that almost led to violence. But for the most part, they lived peacefully together on the island. By the 1640s, the Native Americans had migrated to other parts of Wisconsin. Shortly after they had left the island, some settlers from the fishing village reported seeing a new group of people on the island. They seemed to be more white settlers, but they wore strange clothes and kept to themselves. No one from the fishing village was ever able to talk to one of these new settlers or even find where they were living. It was around this time too that strange things started to happen in the village. Several animals, it's not mentioned what they were, but maybe it was pigs or chickens kept by the settlers, were found slaughtered in the village and seemed to have been used to make markings and blood on some of the buildings in the village. On a different night, a building used for preserving meat burned down. The villagers felt that these things must have been done by these new people on the island, and they intended to find them, but after a thorough search of the island, including the wooded inland area, they never found a, a single person. These strange occurrences seemed to stop soon after the search, and none of the other settlers were ever seen again as well. In 1836, the lighthouse that was built on the northern part of the island, after construction was finished, the lighthouse was inspected and it was reported back that the material of which the lighthouse and the dwelling are made are of the best quality and that the work is done in a substantive and workmanlike manner. David E. Corbin was appointed the first keeper of the light on December 19, 1837. Only three years later in 1840, despite the apparent quality of the construction of the lighthouse, David Corbin started to complain that the plaster started to fall off the building and some sort of liquid would ooze through the cracks, leaving the house constantly damp. Corbin was completely alone most of the time at the lighthouse and some have said when visiting him that he would stare at a certain wall and sometimes spoke vaguely of the other visitors. In 1845, after eight years of relative solitude at the lighthouse, an inspector visited the lighthouse keeper and determined that while Corbin was fulfilling his duties, he was acting strange. The official report says that the inspector ordered Corbin to take a 25-day leave of absence to find a wife to live with him at the lighthouse. However, some think that the inspector was startled by Corbin's mental state caused by years of solitude and thought that it would be best that he spend some time away from the island altogether. In 1852, Corbin reportedly fell ill and died that December, in that same lighthouse. He was buried in a small cemetery just south of the lighthouse. Now, the next lighthouse keeper also reported the surprisingly quick deterioration of the lighthouse. Some friends that had visited the new keeper said that he would talk of seeing strange things in the house at night, but he wouldn't elaborate on what he had seen. In 1858, after only 22 years of service, the original lighthouse was torn down and a new one was built. From that point on, the lighthouse keepers were required to have an assistant keeper or a family with them at the lighthouse. No strange occurrences were further reported in the lighthouse logbook, outside of strong storms and occasional shipwrecks, except on January 20, 1876. The keeper at the time, named Betts, reported that he saw two men attempting to row to the mainland from Washington Island. He wrote that a, a terrible storm came up shortly after their departure, and they never made it to their destination. Over three months later, on May 3rd of 1876, Betts wrote that the two men were lost last January, have since been seen several times, once from Caney Lighthouse and once from Jacksonport. The men are apparently frozen stiff and sitting upright in the boat among a mass of ice. At last account, they were still adrift, there's not much hope that they'll be found and buried. By 1900, most of the island's inhabitants left for better fishing areas on Lake Michigan. In 1910, a successful business owner and inventor, Chester Thordeson, purchased all of the island except for the land that the lighthouse occupied in the north. He used the island as a private summer retreat from his business in Chicago. He is responsible for the unique and mystifying buildings and structures that are still on the island today. On the south end of the island, he built a giant stone wall that has a boathouse on the lower level. A stone water tower was built on the east side of the island, and an imposing wooden gate was constructed on the west end of the island. 
The great hall that was used to store Thordeson's immense book collection was there too. He had over 11,000 books and it's rumored that he possessed some very rare books on the occult in his collection too. Thordeson died of heart failure on January 6, 1945, though some have speculated that he saw something that actually scared him to death. I couldn't find any writings from Thordeson, however, that mentioned him experiencing anything strange on the island. After his death, though, multiple churches and universities were interested in his book collection, but he had willed it to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, providing that they had to purchase it for $300,000, which they did. Some of this history is hard to find on the internet, but there are a couple of binders in the Great Hall that has a lot of this documented. Thordeson's personal papers are housed in the archive section of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin as well. Now, all of this history I gave is just to provide a little bit of context for experiences that I have had, directly or indirectly, on Rock Island. In August of 2021, I took my first and last trip to Rock Island. After taking two ferry rides, I arrived on the island at about 2pm. I had booked the remote campsite E, which is a backpacking site that is a little over a mile from the dock. I took my time hiking out to the site to enjoy the scenery and took a couple of breaks just due to how heavy my pack was. I was definitely packed more for camping than hiking to be honest, but I got to my site, set up my tent, got everything situated and started gathering sticks and driftwood from the beach so I could start a fire. On my third trip back from the beach, before I got back to my campsite, I heard a single sort of high-pitched squeal noise coming from the forest. It didn't sound close, but it was such an unusual sound that I stopped in my tracks and waited for a good 30 seconds, waiting to see if it would happen again. It didn't, so I continued back to my site, and when I got back, I began working on getting a fire started. The remote camping sites on Rock Island are pretty well spaced out. Sites C, D, and E are grouped together, but there's probably a hundred yards between each site. There's not a real trail connecting the three sites directly, but enough people have walked along the ridge between the three sites that there's an obvious path now. As I was setting some sticks up on my fire ring, something caught my eye though and I looked up. Fairly far away, it looked like it might have been at maybe site D or a little further, was a person running in my direction. My first thought was, well, that's odd because like I said, it's not even really a trail that they were on. Then my mind just went up to, well, there must be something wrong and this person needs help. They got a little closer and it looked like maybe it was a woman in loose gray clothes, maybe a hoodie. It was still far enough away that I couldn't really make out the details at this point, but I quickly stood up from the crouching position that I was in and just as I did, I heard that high-pitched squeal noise again. This time it was behind me and it was much closer. This startled me quite a bit so I turned around to look behind me. I scanned the trees for a couple of seconds but didn't see or hear anything. I turned back around because I knew the running person must be getting close now but when I did, they were gone. Again, I stood there and scanned the trees but I didn't see them anywhere. I was honestly so confused that I was just kind of frozen for a few seconds. It was all very strange, but I was able to reason it out of my head that it was a, a fellow camper from site COD that was maybe running to pit the toilet that was a couple of hundred yards west of the sites or something like that. I tried to forget about it, but it really bothered me, I'm not going to lie. I really did not like whatever that squeal noise was too, and... I don't know, I just felt strange all of a sudden. With some effort though, I decided to let it go and started my fire. I had a quick meal and a couple of adult beverages and then decided to take a little walk. I hadn't seen sites C or D yet, so I thought that I would check those out and see if I did have some neighbors camping nearby or something. Site D was empty, I did see the path that led from that site to the main trail and pit toilet, so... That made me feel a little bit less uneasy about the runner. I figured that it was maybe someone from Site C that took a strange way to get to the main trail by going through Site D or something. It didn't make a lot of sense, obviously, because I probably still should have seen them, but it made me feel better. 
I continued on to Site C and saw that there was a tent up. I really didn't want to bother anyone, but I just thought maybe I would go over with the excuse that I would introduce myself as a camping neighbor from Site E and see if anyone looked like they might have been the person running earlier. I came up on the site and there was a couple sitting at the picnic table. Neither of them looked like they would have been the person that I saw running, but I introduced myself nevertheless and they introduced themselves too. They were probably in their mid-30s and they were really nice too. Both of them seemed to be pretty drunk, but not quite off their face yet, I guess you could say. I didn't ask about the runner in the end or the squealing noises because I thought that that might be weird. And in the end, I just wished them a good night and I walked back to my tent. When I got back, I had a cigar and a few more drinks. It got dark and it started as a perfect night. The sky was clear and I was just staring up and looking at the millions of stars and I felt better about everything from earlier and felt a little bit stupid about the whole thing and decided in the end to just get some sleep. It was a long day and so I fell asleep almost immediately as well. At around 2.30 in the morning though, I woke up to a huge boom of thunder. It started downpouring like crazy. The wind picked up and the temperature dropped and I love camping in the rain but I do not like camping in a lightning storm. A pretty big storm came through and I was starting to worry a bit. The wind was whipping at my tent and the ground was shaking from the thunder and the lightning and I didn't feel good about being out there in a tent and felt pretty exposed. The storm lasted for about an hour as well before it became just a sort of light and steady drizzle. I was starting to fall back to sleep too when it was then that I heard that squeal noise again. I opened up my eyes wide in the dark and I just laid there silent. There was another loud squeal noise and it was pretty close. Now, I knew that there were no real dangerous animals on Rock Island. There are deer and porcupines, but nothing like bear or wolves. Knowing that still didn't make me feel better though, because there was just something about that squeal that it just seemed, I don't know, weird to me. I didn't like it. I say squeal though, because that's the best that I can describe it. It sounded to me a lot like a pig squeal and... While I honestly don't know that much about pig noises, that's what I thought of when I heard it. An injured or perhaps angry pig squeal. In any case, I continued to lay in my tent and that's when I started to hear footsteps outside my tent. It was still raining so the sounds were a little bit buried in the sound of the rain but it definitely sounded like a, a somewhat large animal or human walking around. At that, I sat up in my tent and I took a knife out that I had just to feel better. In my head, I just kept saying, you know it's just an animal, it's fine. There's nothing in these woods that can hurt you. I listened as the footsteps started moving away from my tent. I just sat there being still holding my knife for maybe 10 minutes without hearing anything else. I started thinking to myself, it's fine. It's just an animal. You're being stupid and you just need to get some sleep. I was just about to lay back down too when there was a very loud squeal. And this time, it was right outside of my tent. It felt like my heart just stopped and a shiver went down my spine. My heart was beating so hard my entire body was pulsing and I felt it in my ears. It took everything in me but I forced out a get out of here. Not shouting, but a stern and mean sounding voice as I could make at that moment. And after that, I didn't hear any more squeals or footsteps the rest of the night. But I also didn't get any sleep. I just sat there in my tent for maybe an hour before I laid down. Eventually, the rain stopped and I kept laying there until the sun came up just listening. All that time, I was trying to reassure myself that... I was just being stupid and that it was just an animal. It was probably around 7am before I decided that I had to get out of my tent to relieve myself. And as soon as I stepped outside of my tent, I saw that my picnic table had been turned over and was now upside down. When I saw this, I surprisingly calmly thought, Oh, okay, this is enough, I'm leaving the island today. I checked my surroundings and nothing else seemed out of place. 
I eventually reasoned with myself that the wind must have blown the table over during the storm. It still seemed a little bit strange because the table was pretty heavy and I felt like I would have heard the table flip over that night, but I made some cold instant coffee and had a bite to eat, started to feel a bit better about the whole thing, and then I decided to go for a hike. I admit too that I get easily scared when I'm camping by myself in the woods. Maybe that's natural, but after I had some coffee and food and the sun came out, I realized that nothing I'd heard or saw was really anything that couldn't be explained. Other than not getting a good night's sleep, I was having a pretty good time to be honest. The reason that I came to the island in the first place was to hike the 7 mile Thordeson's Loop Trail that has a lot of interesting things to see, and I was excited to start the hike today. So I packed a few things in my backpack and I started off. Now, fairly close to my side is the water tower. I have no idea how it originally worked or why it had to be a tower, but it's an impressive building with a fireplace that looked like someone had recently had a fire in it. A little further down the trail was a cemetery where two sisters and a few others are buried. It's believed that there are still more buried here in the unmarked graves too, but these likely are some of the settlers from the old fishing village. Now, the island has three cemeteries in total. There's one by the beach and... That's where Chester Thordeson is buried. There's one in the eastern part of the island where the two sisters are buried. And there's one on the northern part of the island where the original lighthouse keeper, David E. Corbin, is buried too. There is also at least one Native American burial area on the island too, but no one knows exactly where that is. Anyway, I kept walking on the trail until I came to a nice scenic overlook area with a bench where I sat down and drank some water. I started to hear some talking on the trail ahead of me, but I couldn't see anyone yet. There was a bend in the trail and the trees were thick, so I sat on the bench waiting for these people to come around the bend. The voices were coming closer and I could tell that they weren't speaking English, but I couldn't place what the language it might have been was and both voices were very, very deep and sort of guttural. Then, back deep in the woods, I heard a loud and quick sort of ooh sound. Immediately, both the voices that I was listening to responded with their own oohs, and I kind of smiled because it sounded like these two heard whatever it was in the woods, and they were trying to be funny and mock it by responding. I got off the bench, put my backpack on, and I started walking in the direction further down the trail where the voices were coming from. But the strangest thing is that I never found those people. That was really weird too, because... I could have sworn that they must have been on that trail somewhere, really close to me. The rest of the hike went very well though. I visited the cemetery where David E. Corbin is buried. I took a self-guided tour of the lighthouse and I passed the wooden gate that apparently used to be part of a larger structure. I walked by the great hall and dock area from where I arrived on the island. I visited some of the other structures on the island too. Came across the cemetery where Chester Thordeson is buried then finished the loop by returning to my campsite. It was a really nice hike with a lot to see and wasn't especially difficult, but by the end of it, I was tired. I did walk down to campsite C to ask the couple that I spoke with the night before how they did with the storm during the night, but they had packed up and left by this time, so unfortunately I didn't get to talk to them. I was disappointed too because I really wanted to ask them about the squealing noises during the night as well. Anyway, the rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. I built a fire, made some meals, had a cigar, and I had some drinks. As soon as it got dark, though, I was ready for bed since I had so little sleep the night before. So, I got in my tent and quickly fell asleep. And I might have been asleep for about three hours when I woke up suddenly again and was immediately fully alert. Nothing that I was aware of caused me to wake up, but... I don't know, I just felt like something was wrong. I sat up in my tent and this part is a little hard to explain so bear with me. So a feeling of just complete dread washed over me all of a sudden. It was unlike anything that I'd ever felt before. It felt like there was something in the tent with me and I could feel that it was angry, seething with anger, rageful even and I could feel its hatred for me. It felt like something very bad was about to happen and I just couldn't do anything about it. 
I started to shiver uncontrollably and then there was a, a smell of like garbage or rotten meat and it got stronger and stronger to the point where I almost threw up but couldn't because I was just completely frozen. I'd never felt so exposed and helpless apart from that point in my life and I stared forward at nothing, just frozen and the weird thing is is that I accepted that whatever was about to happen to me was just going to happen. It was like my brain telling me that whatever is about to happen, even if it is death, will at least be relief. And then, all of a sudden, I just blacked out. At least, I have to assume I passed out because that's all I remember until I woke up at about 10am that morning. Now, when I woke up, I was laying outside of my sleeping bag on top of it and my legs were in a really sort of unnatural and uncomfortable position. I was on my back with my left leg straight out and my right leg was bent so that my foot was up against my left knee. My heart started pounding but I kept thinking to myself that it was a dream. It must have been. But I'm leaving right now. But it was a dream. I packed up everything very quickly and I started back toward the dock to catch the first boat off the island at this point. But since the first boat from Washington Island doesn't arrive until 10.30 in the morning, I had to kill a little bit of time around the Great Hall and dock area. I wanted to get off that island though so bad, but I did feel a little better just being out of the woods, I'll admit, and that I could see other people as well. I sat down on a bench a little to the east of the dock and lit a cigar just to give me something to do while trying not to think about the night before. I was sitting a few minutes and scanning out over the water when I was startled by someone behind me saying hi. I jumped and was really embarrassed when the person came around saying, Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I saw you smoking and just came over to ask if you had a lighter. I felt a bit like an idiot and told him that that was fine. I just didn't sleep well last night and was kind of zoned out and I handed him my lighter. He thanked me, lit a cigar and then handed the lighter back to me. We made some small talk and then started talking about the unusual things that you might talk about. He said that he was from the Madison area. We talked about the storms that we'd been having and he seemed to be a real outdoorsy kind of guy as well and talked about his plans to move to Washington Island. It was a nice normal conversation and kind of took my mind off the night that I'd just had for a little bit. He seemed like a, a pretty nice guy. Then naturally he asked me what site I'd been staying at I told him that I was staying at site E the last two nights, and he said that he usually books that site, but I must have reserved it before him. He said that he had booked site D the last two nights, and I was surprised by this because no tent or anything was at site D the two times that I walked past the site. I told him this, and he said that he comes to the island a few times a year, and you have to sort of book a site, but he actually camps at a different area on the island. I asked him where he camps and he told me that most of the time he camps in the East Cemetery but he also likes to camp in the woods south of the lighthouse. He told me that he hikes about halfway down the Fernwood Trail and just heads north into the woods where he finds a place to camp. He said that one time he found the ruins of a small log house in those woods and he's going to try and find it again and camp inside of it. At this point I started to change my opinion about this guy and I wanted to change the subject but then he asked me if I heard the screeches in the woods and at that I took a second to reply and knew exactly what he was talking about. I told him that I had and asked if he knew what it was. This time he took a second to reply and I saw his face change. He looked as if he was thinking if he should tell me something, almost like a, a secret I guess, but with no expression at all on his face. He just said, matter-of-factly, a demon lives on this island. Now, under any other circumstance, I would have laughed this off for sure, but not after what I had experienced the night before. He looked at me and must have seen the anxiety and the fear that I was feeling. He surprised me by letting out a quick laugh, and then he asked me if I had saw anything that night. I told him that I hadn't seen anything, and he stared at me like he was trying to figure something out. I felt like he could tell that I'd experienced something. And at this point, I was ready for the conversation to be over. 
But then he told me that he had seen something in the cemetery that night. Now, his face and mood kind of changed again, like he was trying to confide in me. I really did not want to ask the question, but I knew that he wanted me to ask it, so I asked him what he saw in the cemetery, but my voice was shaky. Then I could tell that he had changed his mind about telling me. He actually looked at me with empathy and told me that what he saw was hard to explain, but if I was afraid of the screeching noises, he didn't think that I should go near the cemetery. I didn't say anything right away, but he said four words without any context. Keepers of the flame. At that, I looked at my cigar and the ash was long. I put it out and told him that I was going to wait by the dock for the boat and he nodded and I started to walk away. After a few steps, he said, Hey, and I turned around to look at him. He just said, don't come back here, okay? I turned around at that and started walking again. I don't know if that was a, a warning or a friendly suggestion, but whatever it was, I took it to heart. I was definitely not going to come back to Rock Island. When I did get home, though, I looked up Keepers of the Flame as it pertained to Rock Island. I found three things that he could have been referring to, in fact the name of the Native Americans that lived on the island. It could be translated to Keepers of the Flame. The lighthouse keepers on the island were sometimes referred to as Keepers of the Flame. But then, there was also a 19th century cult that was said to visit the island from time to time that called themselves the Keepers of the Flame. I know that hundreds of people visit Rock Island every year and they have a great time camping, hiking the trails and exploring Chester Thordeson's buildings, but... My humble suggestion is this, do not go to Rock Island. So my name is Natalia, but people call me Tali, and I'm a 20 year old language student from Leicester, currently doing my year abroad in the south of France. I haven't made too many friends here, I'm not too much of a party girl like my big sister, but the friends that I have, I hold dear to me. I'll try not to bore you too much with the details of my life here, but so far after the first few months, nothing too eventful has happened, besides a couple of run-ins with some local troublemakers. But other than that, I've had a really nice time. The food here is lovely, the city is beautiful, and the weather is a lot nicer than back at home. But a couple of weeks ago, we took a trip around to the south to my friend Clement's hometown. There are lots of beautiful little villages scattered around this part of the countryside which are very peaceful, calm, and the people are really pleasant. This is not an area that tourists typically visit. You find that the locals are often bemused to find a foreign person in this part of the country. Not too far from here, there is a slightly larger village, and with the danger of sounding like a broken record, this is another very stunning part of the country that probably not many people know about besides the locals. In the town, there's a Michelin star restaurant, and we decided to pay a visit here for my boyfriend Brad's birthday, his 23rd to be exact. And as it was now two years since we had met, it was nearly our second anniversary too. He had taken time off work to come to France to visit me, and we were glad to be spending some time together again finally. We booked a table for four in the restaurant, me, Brad, Clement, and his girlfriend, Jeanette. Initially, we had wanted to book into the restaurant's hotel as well. However, it was too dear for students like us, so we booked into an Airbnb instead on the outskirts of town. We enjoyed a lovely meal, and then sat outside drinking wine and smoking cigarettes in true French fashion. We then went for a late night stroll through the town, enjoying the quaint little frog statue situated within the town. After we got too tired, we decided to head back to our Airbnb and rest for the night before we would head off to our next destination. Clement's girlfriend was Catholic and always wanted to visit Lourdes every year as a part of her faith. We eventually made it back to the room and had another glass of wine and a couple more cigarettes before we headed off to bed around 1 in the morning. Now, I woke up at around 3am to the sound of something scratching by the door or window I couldn't really tell as I had never been here before. I wondered if it could have been a dog or perhaps another small animal like a cat maybe. However, the sounds faded away almost as quickly as they appeared and I quickly drifted off back to sleep. 
Not long after, however, I was awoken again. Not because of any sound from outside this time, but because Brad had gotten up for the bathroom. I lay back down on the pillow and closed my eyes, but then a, a sudden sense of dread filled me up. I don't know how, but I had a feeling that somebody was just watching me. I looked around the room, with only the moonlight bringing in just enough light to see. I looked over to the window, which should have been closed via the shutter, but again with Brad not being used to the life around here, had forgotten to lock it. And I could see it slowly being pulled open by a hand outside, its silhouette lit by the moonlight, attempting to open the window while holding something that I couldn't quite make out. I then heard what sounded like an old-fashioned camera shutter closing repeatedly. I hadn't heard one of these in many years, not since my grandfather would take family photos of us, but as I've heard this so many times before, it was unmistakable to me that that was the sound. What felt like an eternity passed by before I could bring myself to open my mouth and yell out to Brad. The person at the window, though, quickly began to climb down, and whilst briefly in the moonlight, I caught a clear glimpse of a very distinctive ring on the left hand. I didn't get a long look at it, but it did appear to be wooden with a distinct marking on one side. Seconds later, the assailant, whoever they were, was gone. Brad rushed outside to try and see who it was, but... All he saw was an empty street, but he could hear the sound of footsteps becoming more and more distant. Obviously, we didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. Neither of us dared to. We checked out of the room as early as we could once there was sunlight as well. Clement and Jeanette, they went to get the car while me and Brad returned the keys to the lockbox. I messaged the host about what happened. Whilst he seemed sympathetic... He said that he wouldn't be taking any action against what happened. A few days have passed since then and we still have no idea who tried to break in. Brad seems to think that it was the host as they weren't too apologetic. However, Clement seems to think that it's because they're rich snobs and don't care about foreigners. So I guess that we'll never likely really figure out who it was. I guess the creepiest thing for me though is that some perv some creep out there who tried to break into our place at night has a photo of me lying nude in bed and I have absolutely no idea who has it and whether or not it might end up online somewhere. I was at a warehouse party that is used as an underground venue. I had a couple of drinks and was chatting with a few people when I saw a friend of mine. John and I had been friends since middle school, in my 30s now, and our friendship only deepened after we graduated from high school. But we have had many one-on-one -on -one hangouts, dinner drinks at a bar, etc. And nothing has ever been weird or awkward between us. But we would discuss the typical topics of family, hobbies, politics, stuff like that. John has always been a bit of a, a loner type, I guess, but... Maintained a few close friendships, and I always chalked it up to him being a bit shy. Overall, I just perceived him as a good person and one of the few male friends that I could trust. Anyway, we engaged in conversation and everything was going completely as usual. Then he randomly mentioned that he was jealous of me. This took me aback as at the time nothing was particularly great about my life. My wage job, no serious significant other, a terrible car, etc. But I began questioning him about why he would be jealous of me and several times he tried to change the subject. I kept pressing him, he sounded depressed and I thought that he needed to open up or something. He goes on to say that he's jealous of the way that I interact with people, how naturally it comes to me, how I always have a positive energy about me and how... I genuinely care about things. I tell him, well, there must be something you care about. But he proceeds to tell me that he doesn't care about anything or anyone and never has. That all of his friendships are based around similar hobbies, but he genuinely doesn't love or care about a single person that he's ever known. I was very disturbed at this point as I could tell that he was being completely sincere. I asked, well, what about Carlos? Carlos is a mutual friend and the person that I thought to be John's closest friend. He replied, even Carlos. 
I kept asking him different questions like, not even your mum or your sister? And he was like, no, I don't care about them. I don't hate them, but I don't love them. I never have. This conversation carries on for a good 30 minutes or so. He describes his thought process about a myriad of things in life since he was a child, basically devoid of feeling and knowing that he was different from others. John and I have taken psychedelics many times, not together, so I asked him, what do you experience when you trip? He replied, oh, visual hallucinations, but mentally all my trips are the same, they're just very dark. I don't have euphoric love or other bliss feelings that some people describe. I have dark fantasies. He goes on to say that he has a proclivity for violence, that it is the only thing that he thinks about that makes him feel anything at all. Then he tells me that he's also killed someone. At this point, the room is spinning around me. I'm utterly terrified and had been for a while and was silently screaming in panic. I didn't feel threatened by him, but I could tell that he was being completely sincere. I've known him since we were kids. He was calm. My eyes were darting around the room, though, when they weren't met with his, looking for an exit alibi. He starts in on the details of the murder. Apparently, he shot a man in the head, a stranger who was unsuspecting. He didn't go into much detail. He was apologizing to me profusely between every detail that he did tell, saying that he deeply regrets telling me all of this about himself, that I'm a beautiful person and that he can't believe I'm the one that he confessed to. He mentions many times that I'm the only person that he's ever told any of this to. He also tells me that he doesn't regret it. He then says that he's going to end it all now, that he's admitted this to me and because all he wants to do is kill people. He then says that he's going to end himself now that he's admitted this to me, and because all he wants to do is kill people, particularly strangers. He then says that if he doesn't end himself, that he'll do it again. We discuss therapy and other options, but ultimately he says that he's going to do it, and now I know why. This entire conversation lasted about two and a half hours. At the end, he swears me to secrecy and tells me that I've been a good friend and gives me his last goodbyes. And now, I'm sure you're wondering, did he actually follow through with it? Well, no, he didn't. And I ended up confiding in a few mutual friends, basically stating, stay away from John. I didn't go to the police as John told me that I was the only person he'd ever confided in. But one of my friends who I confided in did go to the police. I don't think anything came of it in the end. John reached out to me several months later telling me that he desperately wanted to kill again. The desire was so strong and he wishes that he could just do it to himself. I blocked him after this on everything. But I did run into him at another party about a year later and we exchanged greetings like nothing weird had ever happened between us. It was the strangest thing and I dread running into him again. When I was a kid, maybe from age 6 to 10, I used to spend the summer with my grandma's sister in rural Tennessee. I called her Auntie John. Most of my family live in rural areas too, but Auntie John's old place was like an hour from the nearest grocery store on an unpaved road, well water, and you get the picture. She taught me a lot about the woods though. Fishing, catching crawdads, how to cook a chicken of the woods or a moral. She passed in 2012, but whenever I do these things, I always think of her. You see, my mum isn't really the best, and my auntie was kind of my female role model, I guess you could say. She wasn't really a religious person, but I do remember some superstitions that she passed on to me. Well, one was that you should never give your real name to a stranger who asks. Instead, you need to give a nickname, like if my name were Catherine, I'd say it was Caddy. Two, there are certain roads in her area that you should never walk on at night because there are entities who will steal your breath. Three, you should have at least the length of two persons lying down, so maybe 10 or 12 feet between your house and any trees on your property. Four, and this one is most relevant to my story, never sleep with a door open 
And if you have the window open, put some acorns on the windowsill. Okay. Whatever. So, now onto the story that I came to share. My cousin Jace was visiting and we told my auntie we wanted to sleep in one of the outbuildings. Basically like a shed. We took our blankets and all of our stuff out there. My cousin's Pokemon cards, some snacks. We probably fell asleep around midnight and we forgot to shut the door. I woke up in the pitch dark. I was itchy from a mosquito bite so I thought that that was why I woke up. But then I heard my cousin breathing weird and he grabbed my wrist. I also felt something walk into the shed even though I couldn't see or hear it. It was sort of like a, a gut feeling I guess you could say. There was a lot of old dust and spider webs on the ceiling and suddenly it just crumbled down onto our blankets like something had brushed the ceiling. I was about to wet myself but Jace grabbed this lighter that we'd been using with a citronella candle and lit it. He said really loudly, this is our place, go away. Once he hit the lighter, we could see though that nobody was there but us. Also, the door wasn't completely open, so only a very thin, small person could have slid through without creaking the hinges. In any case, we didn't sleep at all after that, and we locked the door tight. We didn't tell Arnie John what happened because we didn't want to get our butts torn up. But that's my story. To this day, I'm really not sure what happened, but there was definitely someone there, I can say that much. I talked to Jace about it a few years ago and his memory is the same, except he was apparently awoken by me laughing in my sleep and then the weird stuff started happening. I do think that something weird happened that night. There's no way that an animal could reach the ceiling to knock the dust down like that and a person couldn't get through the door without making noise. What I'm getting at though is that there was definitely someone in there that night. When I was younger, my family and I used to live in this townhouse neighborhood. But my dad was a maintenance worker there and as our family grew bigger, I came first, followed by my sister and brother, 6 and 11 years later respectively. We moved into larger townhouses that the apartment complex had available. When my parents had my younger sibling, there were plans to move out of our neighborhood and into our own house, despite only having just moved into a new townhouse a few weeks prior. We ended up moving out after only two months. While living there, I ended up having a reoccurring sleep paralysis dream of this thing that would come out of my closet. The best way that I could describe it was that it was very lanky and had glowing white eyes and it never made any noise. Scattered throughout those two months living there, I would keep dreaming of it slowly opening my closet, peeking its head out and slowly shuffling towards me. Each night I had the dream, it seemed to be getting closer to my bed too. Now, if my experience stopped there, I would definitely just mark it all down as sleep paralysis. But my last night sleeping there and the following morning before moving makes me question everything that happened and whether or not it was real or just in my head. So, pretty much everything had been taken out of my room except for my mattress since we were moving the next day. So I basically just slept that night in a bare room. Of course, I had to be visited one last time by this sleep paralysis thing before I went away. And this night, it ended up right beside me, looking down and reached down and actually grabbed my arm. But that was when I jolted awake to find a huge scratch running from my armpit to my inner elbow. I remember it stinging like a bee sting and it definitely wasn't there when I went to bed and my dad coming in to see me freaking out and crying. After calming down, we also ate breakfast and did a sweep throughout the house to make sure that we weren't leaving anything behind. Me and my dad went to my room and got the mattress and then opened up the closet to make sure everything was grabbed in there. But as he opened it, half of our attic crawl space access panel fell to the ground, startling both of us. Up until this point, everything about my dreams could have easily been explained. This last night there is what really scares me. Those panels, they don't just simply break. You have to put a decent amount of force on them to start to crack them apart like that. None of us know of anything that could have caused that to happen and we've thought about it endlessly. 
that, plus the fact that I had that scratch after the dream. I don't know. There was something weird about that house. If anyone has any ideas as to what to happen over the course of those months, or if anyone has had any similar experiences, then please do let me know. This is something that has been on my mind for quite some time, and after finding this place, I thought it would be great to share my experience. Now, I would consider myself a skeptic, but one particular period of my life has just always had me guessing. I just have no explanation for what I experienced there, and it's always stuck with me. So, I was around 11 years old when my family moved into a house that was built around the year 1910. It was a fairly large house consisting of an unfinished basement, main floor and the attic. The attic had been converted some years earlier into two bedrooms and a bathroom. It was decided that my brother, seven years younger, and I would share the two bedrooms in the attic. Starting from the first night in the home, I was uneasy and generally uncomfortable, especially when I was alone upstairs. Part of me wants to attribute this to my new surroundings, but who knows. The upstairs area in particular gave me the creeps. The long staircase up into the hallway was always dimly lit and led straight into a hallway, obscuring any line of sight that you would have from the bottom of the stairs. And just thinking about it, man, it gives me chills to this day. The first few months were, well, pretty much uneventful. It was probably around maybe six months into living in the home when I would get woken up in the middle of the night from what sounded like thumping coming from the stairwell. For some context, my bedroom wall shared a wall with the stairwell, and it sounded like someone sort of lightly hitting the stairwell wall with their palm. Not a smack, not a knock, but a very distinct thump. It did frighten me, but it would not last more than maybe a few thumps, and then I would just fall back to sleep. This would happen about every other night for a week or so, and then I would not hear the thumping again for maybe a month. I always dreaded it, though. In the periods of time that I didn't hear the noises, I was relieved and optimistic in thinking that it had gone away for good. But, without fail, it would always come back. It gave me a, a sinking feeling in my chest when I would wake up hearing the thumping on the other side of the wall. Then it would go away again for a few months. No one else in the house was hearing anything and my parents told me that it was just the house settling. The thudding of the house just settling. Extremely normal, right? To be fair, it could have really been that, but after I had accepted that this was probably not going to stop... I began to become increasingly uneasy in my bedroom and the upstairs in general. I slept with my light on every night. I refused to spend any time in my room unless I was going to bed. By now I was 12 or 13 years old and I began to get a, an increasingly irritated and stupidly confident uh, sort of attitude about trying to find out what was causing this noise in the stairwell in the early hours of the morning. If I was feeling particularly brave... I would get out of bed, open my bedroom door and flip on the hallway light. But nothing was ever there. Everyone in the house was sound asleep. After closing the door and getting back into bed though, the thudding would always begin again and that was very weird. By this time, it had gotten significantly louder but still occurring in the same frequency as before. In hindsight though, I... I'd have made a mistake in being so confident in catching whatever it was making this noise. Around the same time, I started to have a very strange reoccurring dream about being in my bedroom, as if I were awake, and there would be a tall man peeking at me from around the corner of my doorframe. I never saw the man's full body, only ever half of his face and his shoulder. I distinctly remember his one eye gazing into my room. I couldn't explain it in any other way except that it was incredibly unsettling. He would just stand there, nothing else. I don't believe that this was a case of sleep paralysis. I mean, I had distinct transitions from being asleep to waking and I knew it was a dream. But by now, we had been living in the house for a few years and my younger brother was now around five or six years old. His reactions to whatever was going on... That was what really creeped me out. 
You see, up until now, I was the only one, from what I knew, having any kind of weird experiences in the house. On one occasion, though, my mum had asked me why I was scaring my little brother at night. I wasn't particularly surprised about the question, to be honest, because I would tease him sometimes. But I asked her what she meant, and she said that my brother had gone and woken our parents up and said that I kept hiding in his closet with my scary mask on. I did have some Halloween masks that he didn't like, but I certainly wasn't hiding in his closet in the middle of the night trying to frighten him. Heck, I was too scared to go into his room at night, let alone hide in the closet in the dark. I'm not sure what he was seeing, but what I do know is that it definitely wasn't me. When I was in middle school, I was feeling more comfortable being in the home alone, and I would sometimes be at home alone all weekend while my family went on camping trips that I just didn't want to go to. The thumping in the hallway hadn't happened in a really long time, and I'd all but forgot about it, to be honest. I had other things on my mind, I suppose. It really never came up until I would sometimes have friends spend the night with me while my parents were out of town. And eventually it came to one of them asking me if my house was haunted. I hadn't really talked with my friends about what I had experienced in the house, so I was definitely surprised by them saying that they would be sleeping on the couch and hear what they described as windows opening and closing in the middle of the night. After that conversation, no one was jumping at the opportunity to stay at my house with me on the weekends too when my family was out of town. Again though, a while passed and nothing out of the ordinary. I had again put it out of my mind. I was sitting on my computer in the downstairs area on a Friday night, waiting on my friend and his parents to come pick me up to go to an event. I was chatting away on MSN Messenger when I heard creaking coming from the upstairs hallway. These were distinct footsteps, nothing like the thumping on the walls. As I was listening, my mind was coming to the realization that I was home alone and these footsteps were not from any of my family members or friends. The footsteps began rapidly coming down the stairs and before I knew it, I jumped out of my seat and bolted out the door to wait outside for my ride. All of a sudden though, the footsteps began rapidly coming down the stairs and before I knew it, I had jumped out of my seat and bolted out of the door to wait outside for my ride. I stood by the street in the middle of the winter, waiting on them to come and pick me up and I had this incredibly unsettling feeling that I was being watched from the upstairs window of my brother's room. To this day, I still don't know what it was that caused that noise and honestly, I would rather never find out. But whatever it was, it sounded exactly like someone running down those stairs. That same night, I stayed at my friend's house and I didn't say anything about the footsteps. To be honest, I just wanted to forget about it. The next day, I came back home to my family and after a few sleepless nights, waiting on the thudding to begin again, it didn't. In fact, everything just stopped. That was the last experience that I ever had. A few years later, my family moved out of the house. A few years after that, the house apparently burned to the ground. It was a, an electrical issue that caused the fire. Every once in a while, I'll share things with my brother too that he will confirm that even with him being so young, he can distinctly remember being creeped out by that house. I'm 31 years old now and... I still don't know what I was experiencing in that house. I can't explain any of it away and I'm confident that it was very real. And I haven't had any similar experiences since I heard those footsteps. If you've stuck with me to this point, then thank you for sticking around. And I guess what I'm looking for is anyone who might have had similar experiences to the thumping and the peaking man. I'm a single mum of a three-year-old little girl. I'm so blessed that I have the most amazing parents who live about 20 minutes away from me, who keep her when I need them to. I live in the city next to their rural area and you have to go down a curvy wooded rural road to get to their house out in the country. Now, my little girl had spent the night with them the night before and I headed out to their house the next day around lunchtime to eat with them and bring her back to our house. It was a pretty day. Sunny, a lot of bikers out though, 
So I was on high alert driving there, as anyone speeding and not paying attention could easily hit a biker, which is a bit of a fear of mine. But I got there fine, ate lunch with them, and was headed back to my house driving on the rural road, which I know like the back of my hand at this point, and typically speed on, knowing when to slow down and take certain curves, etc. My little girl requested that I put on her favorite songs in the car, so I was kind of watching her sing as she sat in her car seat in the back of the car through my rearview mirror. As we drove back home, I caught a glimpse of something blue up ahead just in the edge of the woods near the road. I was going fast enough that the image didn't quite set in as I approached and then passed it. But right after passing it, my brain finally processed that it was a blue old car. It was flipped upside down and had also rammed into a tree. The road was empty with only one house near, and there weren't any ambulances or cars near, so at first I was like, what the heck? Truly, the wreck didn't look like it had just happened, but I knew something was wrong in my gut. I pulled my phone out and called 911 as I kept driving, not fully processing what had just happened. This is 911, what's your emergency? Oh, uh, hey, um, so I'm driving down the road near, and I gave him the road, and I just passed a blue car flipped upside down. It looks like they may have ran into a tree. There wasn't anyone visible near the car and no other cars around. I'm not sure if I was the first person on the scene or what. So what is your exact location? Is there a house close to the wreck? Try to find the nearest address. I'm sending an ambulance out now. Was anyone visibly hurt or present at the scene? No, no, I didn't see anyone when I passed, but I'm really not sure. I didn't get a super good look, if I'm being honest. I'm about two minutes down the road past the car now. now let me turn around and go back. I have my three-year-old little girl in the car with me, just letting you know. I don't necessarily want her to see anything traumatizing, but I'll do what I need to do if I find anyone. The car looked super bad, though. It's okay. Don't get out of your car, alright? Keep your doors locked. Just see if you can find the nearest address and I'll stay on the phone with you the whole time. I turned around in the nearest driveway to me and drove back, speeding with my heart beating fast as I now realize someone clearly might be severely hurt and I just passed them by, not thinking that I was the first to arrive on the scene. I was scared but in action mode, ready to deal with what I was potentially about to see inside this vehicle. When I got to the house that I thought was closest to the wreck, the conversation picked up with the operator. Okay, so I think I'm almost to the car now. I see a mailbox coming up right here. Hang on. Okay, it's... And I gave her the road. This is the house a little less than maybe a mile from the car, I would guess. I'm headed from and going towards, and again, I gave her all the details. And I see a car right here coming up on my left, across from the sandpit looking area. It's a blue older four-door car, I think. Okay, great. Well, an ambulance was just dispatched and it won't be long before they get there. Do you see anyone in or near the vehicle? What the... Wait, yeah. I see a man around 25 or 30. He's standing in the middle of the road. I pull up next to the man with the doors locked, rolled my window down with the phone still on my ear and 911 listening to me speak. I immediately say... Oh my goodness, are you okay? Is that your car? The guy is slurring his words a little, clearly very injured, but still standing and not in a critical condition. He says, uh, yeah, I'm fine. That's when I notice a large wound on the side of his head with blood all over it. I say, you're bleeding. You aren't okay. Look, I'm on the phone with 911 right now. They're sending an ambulance. Don't move. I hear the 911 operator asking me if he was okay or if he was hurt in my ear. I say, no he isn't, he's bleeding from his head, but he's standing in the road. That was when I see the guy's face though go from concerned about getting help to fully panicked and flat. He says, is that 911 on the phone? Hang up, I need you to drive me up the road right now, hang up the phone. The operator hears him say this and she says, is your daughter in the vehicle with you? I say yes, I can't drive this man anywhere, I'm not letting him in my car, especially with my little girl in here. Meanwhile, my daughter is silent in the back seat, taking everything happening in. But that's when I look down and also notice that the man isn't wearing shoes. He's standing with bare feet and there's a large wet stain on his blue jeans, which I immediately realize is pee. 
I can smell alcohol on him and he isn't even standing that close to me. Now, I work in the medical field and I deal with traumatic brain injury patients often, so I immediately wondered if maybe he had some kind of brain damage from the impact and began telling the operator, he isn't okay, I think that he's really hurt. I look at the man, staying as calm and matter-of-fact as I can, and tell him, oh, Look, I'm really sorry, but I can't drive you anywhere. My little girl is in the back seat, and I just don't feel comfortable doing that. I didn't see anyone in the vehicle when I passed, so I'd already called 911. I think you need to let them come. I can't let you in my car, but I'll park over here and make sure that you're okay until they get here. The man is visibly panicked and now really ticked off. He starts yelling, tell them not to come, hang up the phone. My heart literally stopped beating. I began slowly and gently pressing the gas, rolling past him to indicate that I'm leaving. The 911 operator says in my ear, pretend to tell me not to come, pretend to hang up with me, but keep me on the line. So, that's exactly what I do. Hey, uh, so I think he's okay, actually. He says he doesn't need any medical help. He lives really close to here. So, actually, I don't think you need to send an ambulance out. Sorry for the miscommunication. Uh, yeah. Okay. But thanks so much. And I fake the hang-up. I set my phone face down in the passenger seat and tell him that I was going to go now, but that I hoped he was going to be okay. That was when I noticed his pocket bulging with something silver peeking out. I knew right then that this man was armed and I had to get the heck out of there quickly. I smiled and said that I was sorry I couldn't really help and then quickly rolled up my window and I sped off, turning around further down the road and passing him again at 65 to 70 miles per hour on a 45 mile per hour road. I was crying hysterically and I picked up the phone to tell the 911 operator what had just happened. She said, it's okay, you did the right thing. You played it cool and appeased him. We have the address and the ambulance is less than five minutes away. As she asked me for my name and identifying information, I see and hear sirens further up ahead. All I can say is that I thank God for the 911 operator coaching me through the situation that day. I still don't know what happened to the man, but I do know that he was clearly intoxicated, dangerous, and fully panicked, which is a scary combination that will make people do things without thinking clearly in an instant. My little girl asked, Mummy, was that man hurt? I saw a boo-boo on his head. I just said, uh, Yes, sweetie, he's okay. He did get a boo-boo, I think. He was playing and bumped into a tree, I guess. But a nurse is going to give him a band-aid, but I'm really glad that we could help him. She was satisfied and smiled, continued to listen to the music and sing when I turned the radio back on. It was a, a terrifying and creepy encounter to say the least. So I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry, but the work that we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaskan Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds of miles. The oil companies, they would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drill pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test the rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet, and when I say that the sun hadn't come up yet, I mean in almost a month and a half. The polar nights are really intense. In any case, this particular well site that we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska. It was deep in the wilderness and our job took a week but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and the end of the ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out from for safety. No cell reception and radios work, only up to a distance I think. If you don't check in or out in a set time they come looking for you to ensure that you're not a popsicle. So it was about 4 in the morning, not that that really matters in the land of endless night. And we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour. But that was when something appeared on the road in our headlights. It was a man, in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket, walking down an ice road in the wilderness tundra at 4am 
and it was minus 20 degrees outside. It's not completely unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting anyway. So maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack? Seemed plausible, at least to me. He didn't acknowledge us though as our trucks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold either. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed that he wasn't Inuit but was Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He still didn't acknowledge us though, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotions too. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in the extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming from him though. He smelt, I don't know, acidic almost, if that makes sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later said that he was just going to try and shake him out of his stupor. But before my buddy's hand could reach him, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy and then at me with this look of pure rage, not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, then this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy, he groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. And at that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream, I'll never forget it. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held onto my buddy to keep him inside. After several moments, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled butt to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we had just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank but policy said that they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore and when he pulled back his sleeve, there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard and we were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened and it was a pretty quiet drive the rest of the way. And we flew home the next day. Now, the next time we saw the guard at this shack, we asked him if they ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrols. He told us that they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12 hour shift and they never saw anything, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us that it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste a shift driving around like that. But it wasn't a prank. I mean, who could make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank like that? We never got a satisfying answer as to what happened that evening. I still wonder about that dude too, if he even was a dude. The Alaskan tundra is a, a weird place and that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll try and jot down some more of my experiences and share them with all of you guys. My family and I went on a trip to the Hocking Hills area of Southern Ohio a few weeks ago. It was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town Moonville Rail Tunnel. I had never been to this area so I didn't know what to expect but I did know that it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We started driving and it's for a lack of a better term, real impoverished where we are driving, the hills have eyes-esque. We literally only see a few cars on the way there and are on the back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into the forest and we're close to the tunnel now. There was a sign that said that we were entering Bubblewood. For a little additional information, I drive a Mercedes that I'm just lucky to have and have my husband in the car. He's a black man with dreadlocks. 
my 10 year old son who is non-verbal autistic and my six-year-old daughter so we drive down this really creepy stone road into the forest and there's nothing back there no houses no cars nobody we see signs that we're close and pull into the parking lot there's a footbridge there and we walk over the footbridge and make our way toward the tunnel which is a lot larger than i expected and we hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel towards us while we're on foot. He gets out of his truck with a chainsaw and it's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere that we go through the tunnel. I tried to make small talk with him and pull some info about if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources, etc. or something like that. But he really wasn't budging. We turn around to walk out of the tunnel and he starts using a chainsaw behind us and the sound is just echoing through the tunnel. I was already worried that my car was sending the wrong idea to the people like we have money or something but we really don't. We rush to the car to get the kids into their booster seats and this guy comes driving over the footbridge in his truck towards us in the parking lot. To this day I honestly don't even know how this truck could have fit on it but he stops again and gets out of his truck and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief, to be honest. About this time, I notice that there are dusty handprints on my car, though. I asked my husband if they were his, and we compared his hand and my son's, and they were definitely not a match. I don't know who could have touched the car, because where we were with the chainsaw man the entire time, I mean, we were the only ones in this spot as far as we knew. In any case, we got out of there as fast as we could after this. But just a few minutes later, I look into my rearview mirror. And there's a bunch of dust kicked up behind us, and there he is. He had had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch us like that. There's nowhere to go in these woods, mind you. The road is basically one lane, and we have no cell phone service or GPS. And every time that I think we lose him, there he is again. At this point, I'm just waiting for my tires to get popped or something, or for this guy to ram me off the road into a ravine in the woods. But finally, we get out of the woods and I turn out and he's still following. We were following print and directions to get back and I ended up making a wrong turn in the excitement, I think. The guy in the truck was finally gone and I turned around to go back past the stone road that goes into the forest. There is one lone house near this road as well, and when I went there, there was his truck, parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods and taken some back way to the tunnel or something. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like a, a very scary movie trope rolled into one single event, and I'm glad that we all got out okay. When I was young, we used to live in a house that had a big sloping backyard that backed down into a big oval. Our fence line was along one end, the other was a big forest that went on for miles, and on the opposite side was a fence line and all the housing estates. Right smack bang in the middle of this field was play equipment. There were zero people around here as it was quite isolated, and not many people frequented this oval. But me and my sister, we used to run down our sloping backyard, jump the fence and run across to the play equipment almost every day. One day though, we went out and we were playing as usual, having loads of fun. I remember climbing to the top of the equipment and sitting there with my sister. As we looked forward though, we were facing the forest side, probably maybe 100 or 200 meters away. There was a row of bushes along the front of the entrance to the forest. But out of nowhere, something caught my eye. It looked like a, a black object bobbed up and down quickly. I told my sister and we started watching that area waiting. Then, clear as day, we saw two people poke their heads up completely dressed in black head to toe. With what I recognize today as possibly balaclavas or hoodies. My sister and I sat there frozen. But this went on for several minutes as they watched us. We made the decision to bolt as fast as we could towards our left, which was our fence line. I ran as fast as I think I ever run straight to the fence, jumped it, and ran straight up the backyard and into our house. 
To this day, me and my sister always mention the people in black, and I get shivers. Maybe it was some people playing a prank, but I doubt it. It just seemed like such an isolated area, and no one would have seen us if a struggle had broken out, but the distance between the forest line would have given us a good chance to run had they attempted anything. We used to go down there every day, so it creeps us out to think about how long they may have been planning this if it wasn't just some elaborate prank. So this was about seven years ago, and I still remember these instances quite well. They left an imprint in my mind, I guess. I was 13, living in an apartment with my mom and older sister. I'd always loved supernatural things, and for some dumb reason thought that it would be so fun and cool of me to make a Ouija board and use it. I only ever did it when I was home alone, and I remember that I always lit candles. It seemed like a, a fun activity to me. That if anything were to happen, it would either be someone or thing helping me or just wanted to be in contact with this side of the world for some reason. I did never really experience anything with the board. No movement, nothing. Though my candles would flicker in a weird way sometimes. Anyway, fast forward a couple of days and I wake up with a, a weird bite mark on my arm that definitely wasn't there the night before. It seemed like it was an impression of a bite made with wax of some sort. Weird, I know. Though my candles were always white and this was a sort of dark caramel color. It was sticky to the touch and it was gross. I remember having to get ready for school and leaving it due to the rush. Though at some point I managed to wash it off. Things seemed pretty normal to be honest. Well, other than the occasional shadow that I would see move out of the corner of my eye, but... For a while, I thought it was nothing. But one night, I suddenly wake up to my foot being scratched along the bottom. Enough to bleed. Not a lot of blood, but torn skin was definitely apparent. My foot had been hanging off the bed and there was just nothing, nothing around at all that could have caused it. Anyways, we moved out of that apartment and when we did, it all stopped. No more dark shadows, no more bite marks, no scratches, nothing. I really don't know if that's that reassuring too because what it tends to suggest is that whatever I was experiencing in that house was real. So my friend and I had a really bizarre experience in a bushwalk and we haven't really been able to wrap our heads around it. So I'm curious to see if anyone here has any ideas about what happened to us or what we may have encountered. Well, we're both pretty experienced bushwalkers. We were pretty confident that we'd be fine on the trail, even though it's not the most well-marked or heavily used trail, and we'd never hiked it before either. But we left at 8am and told family members where we were going and that we planned to be back around maybe 4pm at the latest. About two hours into our walk was the first sign that something was off. We couldn't get our GPS to work correctly. It was showing us as being in a completely different area to where we were. This was weird, but it wasn't a big deal since we did have a map. But at about uh, maybe 1pm is when things got really strange. We had stopped to check the map. And my friend said, Hey, I think we took a wrong turn back there somewhere. Then we both sort of felt off balance for a few seconds. And it was then dark. I mean, it was like the sun went out. When we checked the time, it was 5.41pm. Which means that... We had apparently been standing in this one place for almost five hours of time. We also started hearing this weird heavy breathing from the direction that we had been walking towards. It sounded like a, maybe a person breathing right next to us, but we couldn't see anyone. And when we called out, there was never any response. We live in Australia, so we didn't have to worry about any large predators or anything. But you hear stories about weirdos who hang out in the bush and murder backpackers and stuff like that, so that was obviously on our minds. We were both extremely unnerved to say the least, and we just didn't feel comfortable moving towards the breathing noise. And on top of that, we agreed that we had made a wrong turn somewhere, so 
We turned and walked the way that we came. We considered calling for help on our satellite phone, but we decided that we'd at least try and backtrack to where we'd lost our way and go from there before calling for help. But the breathing? It followed us as we walked. But we were both feeling dizzy, we were convinced that we were being followed by a serial killer, and we were too scared to stop and try to call for help, believing that if we alerted whoever was following us that help was on the way, that it would prompt them to attack. Eventually, I was just too dizzy to continue as well, so we ended up stopping and called for help. We were instructed to stay where we were and wait for the rescue, but the breathing sound wasn't going away, so we kept moving back towards where we thought that we'd left the trail whenever I was well enough to walk for a few minutes. The breathing, though, it followed. Eventually, too, we found a, a set of stairs that was marked on the map, so we were able to more accurately tell rescuers where we were. And I fainted while waiting for the rescuers. My friend tells me that the breathing not only continued, but sounded like it was circling us. He said that there were never any sounds of footsteps or any indication that there was anyone there, except for the breathing, of course. She admitted that by the time the SES arrived, she was hysterical. But we were both rescued without any physical injuries. The source of the breathing, our dizziness, and our lost time was never identified, and it was pretty much brushed off as just the product of panic brains. Even our families didn't believe us. They thought that we'd just gotten lost and had been too embarrassed to call for help. Shortly after this happened though, she told me that she was having nightmares about the breathing sound and the dizziness and the sense of unease she felt. She mentioned that she didn't feel like she ever wanted to go bushwalking or camping again and to my knowledge she never did after that too. But that was pretty much the last time that I heard from her for like over two years. Until a few weeks ago when she reached out to me to catch up. We had a short chat, but we didn't mention this incident. Tragically, a week later, she took her own life. I don't know how much our experience played a part in her mental health. I know that there are always many factors in this sort of thing, and it would be silly to think that I could have prevented it, but I feel really guilty that I didn't try to stay in contact with her. No one else believed her about what happened, and... I know that that affected her a lot. In the end, I really don't know if I'll ever have closure about what happened to us and how, if at all, it contributed to her death. I guess I'm just wondering if this experience sounds familiar to anyone, if anyone has heard of anything like this. So me and my sister and my mum have been trying to make sense of this for the past couple of hours, and the facts get less comforting the more we compare our experiences of that night. So last Friday, I, a 17-year-old male, was home alone while my family, besides my sister, 21, who was at work, stayed in their cabin a few kilometres away. I'm used to staying home alone, as this exact scenario is pretty common in the summertime, especially while I'm working and I can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore. I think I'm just used to the odd creaks and settling noises of the old house now. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night, and most noises could be attributed to him. And if anything were to happen, he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he is the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the door or the windows, so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday, the sound of his barks at nearly 12am were disconcerting to say the least. Despite my comfort with staying home alone, I'm still pretty afraid of the premise of break-in or that some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. So I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone walking past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway, and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few moments too long, and I finally got out of bed, my sleep in the basement, and walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door. I was comforted for a moment until 
I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep, and saw the door open about two or three inches. I froze. I had let Bosco the dog out earlier that night, but I know that I closed that door. I've never left this door open, in fact. I mean, I'm a paranoid person with pretty bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins, like I said. So I would never, ever, home alone, forget to close the door. I'm 100% certain of that. But at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts or even acknowledge that I could not have left the door open because I knew it would send me into a spiral, possibly even into an anxiety or panic attack if I didn't explain this away. So I closed the locked door, double checking that it was certainly locked. Using the flashlight on my phone, the lights were all off, I looked around the entire second floor of the three floor house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots, just to put my mind at ease and upon finding nothing, I went back downstairs to my room. Now, as I was down there trying to push away the fear, I could hear Bosco walking around on the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought that I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps, accompanied by Bosco's footsteps. He walks around for about maybe 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and talk myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2am that same night, my sister comes back home from work. I woke up a few minutes before this to Bosco in the basement, which he never does. There's even a gate to stop him from getting to the basement in fact, whining at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in and we let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door, letting him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work for the next few days, and forgot to mention it to anyone until tonight. But my sister and my mum were both home with me for a movie night, while my dad and my brothers stay at the cabin. I remembered the door situation when we were packing our horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a, a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again the same door that was locked from the inside and not opened since earlier that night. My stomach immediately dropped and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. I mean, maybe she had let Bosco out and forgot to close it until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. Then we were trying to justify a reason that someone would break in to not steal anything and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me, then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then, this hypothetical person would be trapped up there, not knowing that this house, that appears empty with the rest of my family gone and all the lights off, was not empty, and there was a dog who would bark if they showed themselves again, alerting me to their presence. Then, when I was in the basement and my sister was in the bathroom, they ran out the glass door, which is timed perfectly to when they found the door open once more, much wider than when I found it, as they were in a hurry on the way out. Perhaps they left it open too the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the door frame. Either way, it ties together too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins with nothing missing, vandalizing or just breaking and enterings many, many times, so it's not as unlikely as it may be in the bigger city. I still can't really make sense of it though, and I am definitely shaken up thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I was asleep, alone in the basement. There's a part of me that just doesn't believe it, but I can't shake the too many coincidences that all tie together to make this as concerning as it is. I moved out of state to a very small town. First day of moving in, a neighbor walking his dog greets me and introduces himself to me. He gives me a quick rundown that the neighborhood is filled with tweakers and the other shady types. I took that as a general warning that 
That may be all that I'll deal with here. A few months later, he invited me over to his place to teach me how to do some woodwork. As we're making a shelf for my cat to sit on, he's asking me questions. To me, they were normal everyday questions, but looking back, I realize now that he was trying to get information out of me. Why did you move out of here from out of state? Who lives with you? Do you have any other family members in the states or any other area? Once we were done, we went to install the shelf and he met my mom who stays with me. He talks to her for a bit and then we left to walk back to his place. He starts telling me that he can see our yard from his place and notices that I barely go outside with my dogs. Told me not to worry that if someone breaks into our place that we can see them and shoot them from his room. That's when I was thinking, how is that possible because you live over half a block away? Before I can question him, he asks if I want to see more of the town. I'm like, yeah, let's go. He walks to his car and pulls something out from the middle compartment and then tells me to go into his pickup truck. So I do while he's filling up the gas tank up with gasoline. But once he's done, he walks to the driver's side and opens the door and drops a, a holster between us. He tells me not to worry about it as I look trying to see if it has a gun or not. As we're driving, I realize that he actually hasn't said a word for five minutes, and this guy loves to hear his own voice. Another thing that I noticed is that we're on a dirt road and haven't seen a single house, trailer, or vehicle for a while now. I guess I gave off some nervous vibes too because he suddenly goes, So yeah, unless you know where you're going out here, you'll get lost, and it's best to have a pickup or an ATV to drive out here. After another 10 minutes of silent driving, we get to a little creek. Luckily, there was another truck there, and all he says is, Oh, look at that. Someone else is here with us. And he grabs the holster and gets out. Well, we both see a lady with a big dog playing in the water. She turns to us as she sees him walking closer to her. She gestures to her holster, and he tells her not to worry, that it's for the snakes. She lifts her shirt above her waist to show her gun, and she tells him that she's not worried one bit. They talk for a few minutes and she tells him that her husband is home waiting for her to make her dinner. And she's just out letting the dogs have some playtime. The neighbor changes his tone and posture from confident to defensive now. She called her dog and they went to their truck. He's watching her and she hasn't started her truck yet. A few minutes pass and he tells me that I guess it's time that we go too. And when we get to his truck, she drives off. The drive back though, I start to get uneasy and creeped out. I mean, why would he drive me all the way out there just to leave? Why tell me not to worry about the holstered gun, but tell the lady what it's for? I finally get out of my head and I just break the silence and give him my life story as, as to why I moved. But finally, he responds that he can relate to my story and gives me the rundown of how the town is and what it's about and that some people are more racist than others, and I should watch my back for that. Once we get back to his place, I tell him that I have stuff to take care of at home, and I just nope the heck out of there. I said to myself that if I'm ever going to hang out with that guy again, that it definitely won't be alone. So, I want to share a, a strange experience that I had in my house. I've lived in this house since the beginning of 2013 and never experienced anything before. This happened a couple of months ago. It actually makes me feel kind of sick as well to think about it, but... Anyway, I was sitting at my kitchen table in my usual spot. My six-year-old daughter was on the second floor of my house in the upstairs living room, more or less right above my head. She was loudly shifting through her Lego box or something, and to my left at the table is the underside of the staircase to the second floor. I can't see who was on the stairs or the top or the bottom of the stairs from where I was sitting. If you were descending the stairs, the door to the room that we used as an office is directly to the right, across a short hallway from the bottom of the stairs. From my chair at the table, I can see the entire hallway between the bottom of the stairs and the door to the office. I can also see a sliver of the interior of the office. 
So, as I was sitting at the table and semi listening to the noise my daughter was making with Legos, I heard someone start walking down the stairs. I wasn't really looking towards the office, but I saw the back of my daughter's head as she walked into the office. Well, so I thought. A few seconds later, though, I heard someone start walking down the stairs, this time louder than the first time that I heard it. I realized that something odd had just happened, so I looked towards the hallway, and I watched as my daughter walked into the office with both her hands full of her Lego creations. I hurried over to the office and looked inside, but my daughter was the only one in there. She was putting her Legos on one of the desks, and so I asked her if she came down to the office and went back and came back down again, but she said that she hadn't. There wasn't enough time for her to go upstairs again, to be honest, and come back down again anyway, and also I would have seen her come out of the office. I didn't see the face of the first daughter to go into the office, but the height appeared about right. It was the same hair color and length and shirt color were correct for my daughter. I am thoroughly creeped out by this. As creeped out as I was when my daughter used to wave and say goodbye to her closet when we would get her up from naps in the morning when she was around too. I'm really unsure of what to make of this. I lived in this house with shadow people when I was my daughter's age and really don't want to deal with anything creepy ever again. So I'm currently sharing this because I'm just too scared to sleep after what happened about two hours ago. So I, a 22 year old female, am a dog sitter. I stay in my clients' homes instead of keeping their dogs at my own house. I'm currently on a job and have been for about a week. Ever since the first night I got here, I felt super unsettled to be in the house by myself at night. I don't think that there was any reason to be because the house is in a gated neighborhood in a decent part of town. It's right next to a freeway, so fairly busy streets outside of the neighborhood. I figured that... It was just because of all the antiques in the house, making it feel sort of like haunted mansion-esque. Anyway, the house that I'm staying in is kind of uh, on the outskirts of the gated community, I guess you could say. It's in a little cul-de-sac with no neighbors to either side or behind. There's also a pedestrian gate to come in or out of the neighborhood right next to this house. And yesterday, when I was leaving for work in the morning... I noticed that the pedestrian gate was wide open. I figured that someone went for a walk or something and made a note to see if it was still open when I got back in the afternoon. I figured that someone went for a walk or something and made a note to see if it was still open when I got back in the afternoon. Sure enough, it was still open and I went over to close it. The gate, however, was in a locked position, so the little lock bar was in place, so... It couldn't latch closed. The bar would block it. I didn't have a key to this gate too, so I was unable to unlock it in order to close it and relock it. Yesterday night after that, I just had the worst gut feeling that something was going to happen too. Now, I have severe anxiety, so often just write things off as that. A bad trait to have as someone who regularly stays in houses all by myself, I know. But anyway... I finally got to sleep last night and everything was fine. Today was normal and I was home from work all day so I didn't leave the house. I should mention too that this house has a gated courtyard out front. I keep it locked all the time so there's no way to get into the front or backyards of the house unless I let you in or if you jump the wall or something. Around 9.45pm tonight I had just gotten into bed with the pup that I'm dog sitting and was about to fall asleep when... I heard someone start knocking hard on either a door or a window of the house. There are about five sliding glass doors leading to either the courtyard, backyard or side yard and I couldn't identify exactly which way it was coming from. The dog of course went crazy and the knocking immediately stopped. Like I said before though, there's no way to get to the house with that courtyard gate locked. So... Whoever was knocking had to have hopped a wall into either the front courtyard or backyard. And if it was a neighbor or something like that, the dog shouldn't have scared them into stopping. 
I was obviously pretty terrified and called my mum who told me to call the police and she and my stepdad headed out to come over. They live like 10 or 15 minutes away from where I'm staying. The police dispatcher was a woman who totally understood how I felt and told me to stay in the bathroom and if any knocking happened again before the officers got there to call back. After I hung up with the police, I tried to call my mum back but my phone suddenly had zero bars of signal which was just the terrifying cherry on top of all of this. The police came and checked out the perimeter, didn't see anything suspicious and so they left. But the part that really scares me is that it had been raining this evening so I was reading with my bedroom sliding glass door open before bed. I usually go to bed later but wanted to sleep early tonight so I was reading with my door wide open and then took the pup out for potty in the back about maybe 20 minutes before the knocking began. It freaks me out a bit that I could have been outside or vulnerable if I had stayed up later like usual. Anyway, in the end nothing really bad happened to me which I'm grateful for but the whole situation was eerie and I don't know, I just felt like someone was watching me the whole time. When I was really little, my mum was a paranormal investigator, so I pretty much grew up around ghosts and stuff like that. But flashback to when I was like in middle school, we moved into a house which was super exciting because pretty much all of my life before then I had been moving around from place to place, staying with people and never really having our own house. So 13, 14 year old me was super excited to have my own room. For a good couple of years, nothing happened too, but then it started slow. The things flying off shelves, hearing footsteps down the hallway, stuff like that. But one night in particular has me almost traumatized for life, I think. I was sleeping when I had woken up to my dog growling, not like her at all, which was weird, as she was staring at the closet. I didn't think much of it, and brought her up to me trying to get her to stop. Then, everything just goes really silent for not even a second when everything on my walls came crashing down all at once. Things that were tacked, nailed, screwed into the wall, didn't matter, everything came down. I hid under my blanket and didn't really sleep for the night. When it was morning, I got up and everything was still on the ground, so I put it all back up. When I told my mum, she said that she didn't hear anything apparently, which blew my mind because it was so loud. But that was really the only major thing that happened, other than a, a few smaller occurrences, but man, it shook me up a lot and I slept with the light on for a good while after that too. So, I feel sort of... Uh, silly even sharing this because I am someone that is entertained by the paranormal I find it fun and spooky but I wouldn't say that I'm a believer per se my belief is very fluid sometimes I think I believe and sometimes I'm a skeptic most of the time I'm a skeptic I think and I can think logically and explain things away however today I saw something with my own two eyes that I cannot explain. So basically, my parents had taken my little girl for a walk to the park as I haven't been feeling very well lately. I've been quite dizzy and sickly for the last week or so. Super, super tired as well as I was glad for the break. They were gone for about an hour and I laid on my bed enjoying the peace and quiet. When they got home, we sat in the living room together just chatting. I was sitting on an armchair facing the window. My mum and my daughter and my dad were sitting on the couch under the window facing me. My dad, though, suddenly said that he felt funny and his vision had gone funny. This alarmed me, so I looked up to ask if he could be getting a migraine or something. When to the side of him, this long, white, almost string thing appeared. I really don't know how to describe it to do it justice, but it was the length of my upper torso. It wasn't see-through, but it wasn't exactly solid either. It was almost like smoke or liquid the way that it moved. It appeared by his head, and in shock I shouted, Dad. 
And to my surprise, he really calmly replied, I know, I see it too. This long hair-like smoke or fog string light thing moved from the side of his head, around the front of his body, and eventually disappeared between him and my daughter on the couch. Both myself and my dad were excitedly exclaiming, Did you see that? Can you believe that? So we both definitely saw the same thing. It didn't move particularly quickly either, which was strange, but my mum had been sat beside my daughter the whole time, but didn't see anything apparently. Just to mention too, I'm not a smoker, nobody in my family smokes, there were no candles lit, no open windows, and I checked the sofa afterwards to see if there had been a cobweb falling or a stray hair or something, but there was nothing. To this day, I still have no idea what it was, but has anyone ever experienced something similar here? I'm finding it quite frustrating that I'm struggling to find the right words to describe this thing that materialized in front of me in broad daylight too. When I was 20, I took a job as a direct care worker at a group home for adults with developmental disabilities. The home that I worked in had six residents, all of which had several physical and mental impairments. None of the residents had the ability to walk or communicate. They were all tube-fed and needed 24-hour care and supervision. I worked the midnight shift from 10pm to 6am. When I arrived for my shift, the residents were already tucked into bed. It was, overall, a, a pretty boring job if I'm being honest. I worked with one other person and we cleaned the house and stocked up on supplies while they slept. Every two hours we would check the residents' briefs and change them as necessary. We also had two medications to pass during our shift and in the last hour we would give two residents showers. Now, one night, my coworker and I were just settling in for our shift. I started a pot of coffee and we chatted. It was around 10.30pm. We had baby monitors in the residents' rooms and in the kitchen so we could hear them if they were in distress. And suddenly, we heard our resident, her name was Rachel, through the monitor. She was coughing and gagging uncontrollably. My co-worker and I jumped up because we knew what was happening. Rachel had been congested that week and she didn't have the ability to roll over herself. This happened several times in the past as well and it was always a serious situation. The excessive coughing could cause her to vomit in which case she would pretty much aspirate and die. But we tended to Rachel immediately, rolling her on her side and using a special suction machine to clear her mouth out. Sure enough, she had vomited quite a bit and we had gotten to her just in time. After a while her coughing ceased and her breathing returned to normal. We cleaned her up, changed her clothes and bedding, and made sure that she was propped up better with pillows. Adrenaline was still pumping through us as the whole situation was a bit frightening for a couple of 20-year-olds with minimal medical training. We agreed, though, that we would check on Rachel frequently for the rest of the night and write an incident report. My co-worker and I left the resident area and headed back toward the common room. I was definitely ready for my coffee at this point, and she was ready for a cigarette. She headed outside and I went to fill up my cup. That's when I noticed that the lights on the coffee pot weren't on. That's weird, I thought. It's plugged in and I hadn't tripped the breaker. I started pouring my cup and I realized that it was ice cold. That didn't make sense to me at all. I mean, I had just started the coffee less than an hour ago. Why wasn't it at least warm? I rolled my eyes figuring that something must be wrong with the coffee pot I dumped it out and went to start again when my co-worker barged through the back door. Her eyes were huge. A little startled, I asked her what was wrong. She asked me if I had looked at the clock yet. I immediately looked up and saw that it now read 5.30am. Before I could make sense of things, she shoved her cell phone in my face, which also read 5.30am, we couldn't have been with Rachel longer than 45 minutes though, but somehow we had lost around 7 hours. Neither of us could make sense of it. We walked back into the back of the house and walked out 7 hours later without time feeling like it had passed at all. We hadn't given out meds, done bed checks, given showers or cleaned anything. 
The next shift was coming in half an hour and it felt like we had just arrived. We did our best to pull it together and at least make it look like we had worked all night. When the next shift arrived, we just sat at the table silently and then we left. We never told any of our co-workers about the experience because, well, would you believe it? It sounded crazy, right? If I hadn't have experienced it myself, I wouldn't believe it either. My co-worker and I lost touch eventually as we both moved on to other jobs. We recently found each other on social media and she sent me a message and asked me about that day. And our memories of the event are exactly the same. Nothing like that has ever happened to either of us again. And I have no idea what happened in those seven hours that apparently just zipped by. I do know that there was never a problem with the coffee pot as well. It just timed out after four hours and shut itself off.